I'm is that so stupid? I hate gag gifts. I hate getting them. Then why, why did you give them? Because I am a white them. woman and I can do whatever I want. Sure. Sure. How about that? Uh, this this is gonna this is gonna be a home run in our household. It's so dumb. I just thought the puzzles could be cool for the kiddos. No, I love it. My we we are obsessed with animals. Certainly with cats. All of a sudden, I didn't think I was a cat person, but I'm a cat person now. And what about cats? Makes you a cat person. This one cat made me fall in love. That'll do it. One cat. We fostered, I think, at this point, six or seven cats, and they kind of came in. We took great care of them, mostly my wife and my kids, and then we found homes for them. But this one cat, I was like, I I think we should keep this. What cat. about it? He's just really um, snuggly and affectionate, and he he's not. I mean, I don't mind aloof. Like I can I I, I can get on board with a cat wanting to live his own life and just you know <laughs> whatever. But I need a little bit of something. And this cat is like a dog, and so far as um, I, I don't I, I, even a dog. Our dogs, and we have two dogs who I love. There's a certain amount of neediness that comes along with being a dog, I think, and so their affection can sometimes push into the neediness. This cat. Has wants affection, wants love back, wants to wants to give affection, wants to give love, and then so every once in a while, like with a fuck bad off. Childhood. Yeah, but no, but then, <laughs> then but then can also be like fuck off. Like I think this cat's secure. Whereas that's why I love dogs so much because they're just endlessly needing attention and love, and yeah. that's what I believe is a healthy relationship. <laughs> sure. Well, now we're okay. Let's get into where it. one person talks and the other is completely mute <laughs> and needs them to survive. I because you know Beth Stern. Uh, she fosters cats, and I remember one time I was um, in New York or something, and I saw this family of cats in New York, like all eating on something. And I went over to try to say hi to them. They're obviously feral, and I'm talking to her, and I'm like, "Hey, okay, I just found these cats. Like, because with a dog, you would get them." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "What should I do? Like, do I try to trap them? Do I throw, you know, blankets over them? What am I do? Do I pick them up by their neck? Like, I don't, what do I do?" And she was like, "You leave them alone." And I was like, "But they're they're cats." And she, they're, she was like, "Well, cats can live outside." And survive. Yeah. And I was like, then why do we rescue them? <laughs> I yeah. was like, which one is it? <laughs> well, I think what a, what a lot of, I, I think in LA County, what they do is they catch them, neuter them, and then send them back out. Because they can survive, but they just don't want them to propagate. Of course, of course, of course. And then I did attempt to rescue a cat once. I saw a cat on the street in my old neighborhood, and it was walking around alone. It was like kind of, you know, and I brought him in my house and spent a couple times uh, days with him, gave him food, and sort of was like socializing him, hanging out with him, taking pictures for social media to get him a home. And then uh, when I put it on Instagram, my neighbor uh, came over and said, "Did you just try to steal my dog? <laughs> give my was a cat. Give my cat oh, away? God. That's amazing. I was like, yeah. I didn't realize it was your cat. It was just yeah. out on the street. Yeah. The cat's on. The, like he, he was like, yeah. She goes for a walk every now and then. Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, okay." So I stole it. Yeah, well, we're in the middle. We're in the middle of that negotiation right now because our cat wants to go outside, and Caitlin's like, "I'm afraid the coyotes. Like, I just yeah, don't want them to get can't. ripped apart." And I'm you like, can't. "Well, I think cats are pretty resilient and tough, and he lived on the streets for a long time." But I do. But will he come back? Oh yeah, he loves me as much as I love him. But you have never tried to let the cat free. No, no, we, we've only had him for a month. You know what you can get. There's um, an item called Not Today Coyote, mm -hmm. where there's a ton of spikes on a vest <laughs> that, is amazing. that you could get for your cat. It's, what? What? it's like armor. It's like, a, it's like it turns your animal into a porcupine. Wait a second. What? But, but hold on a second. What? But then you have to put that on every single time he wants to go for a, like go outside. And to me, I'm trying to figure out ways in which we have less responsibility because right now mm -hmm. we if have you to let him very... out you will have no responsibility <laughs> well i mean because... so far as like leaving the door open like we leave the door doors open for the dogs so the dogs can come in right. and out right. because they can they're fine and then but now we have to close the doors but then if the dogs have to get out then they're scratching at the window and then we have to go out. so i'm trying to figure out ways whack-a-mole which... yeah i know that animal whack-a-mole thing yeah but if you have a yard can't the cat just go in the yard well yes but then i mean the cat could but we've had coyotes in the in the backyard oh, before, yeah. Yes, yes. Coyotes don't fuck around. No, they don't. No. They a friend of mine uh, that you probably know came home to her Chihuahua. It was not only dead, but the head was on one side of the yard and the body was on the other side of the yard. I mean, they decapitate the animal. Yeah. It's not just I'm going to kill your animal and fuck up your day. It's like I'm going to make you look at the inside of the thing yeah. you love. I've got a couple friends who have similar stories, and my, we have a bigger dog and a small dog, a, a French bulldog, and he I'm a little bit nervous about. You should be. And the cat I'm actually less nervous about because the cat can def defend itself. Or jump or... Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, those, th those Frenchies are... Well, I mean, they can hardly breathe, much yes. less... <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> much less win a fight. Yeah, they are genetic mutants. Okay, I love cats. I'm nervous about being on your podcast. Why? 
because I'm always nervous about um, doing podcasts that are that are so uh, first of all hosted by comedians, but then also have so many comedians on. Mm. Because I'm I'm concerned that I can't be that it's just not going to be funny. You, you, oh, don't you worry. So this oh, wow. is on the other side of my yard at all times. Oh, the, yeah, those yeah. coyotes. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're they come out every day at five. A huge pack, and they look healthy. They do not look skinny. No, they're they're, they're finding. And what they then need. every couple weeks, I see a sign in my neighborhood: "Lost cat." I'm like, bitch, <laughs> if you want me yeah. to find your cat, I'm gonna need to cut a coyote open. Yes. Yeah. You gotta be. You gotta be careful. I'm nervous about this too, because I am like a real fan of yours, uh, personally and professionally. Do you remember the night I ambushed you and your wife at a party? Yes. And embarrassed myself deeply. I I wouldn't consider that. Well, I can't speak for, to to how you felt, but I was uh, very excited by it. Uh, I know exactly when it was and where it was and what and what the party was and all that. It was in Beverly Hills. It was in a restaurant. It was a CAA party. Yes. And it was yes. around the Emmys. Um, <laughs> and um, not that either of us were nominated for Emmys. No, we no, 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 no. But no. we were going to the various parties and. But I, but I had met you years prior. Yes. And I don't know if you remember that because I told that story to you, and I think that I, don't I think, had disassociated that whole moment. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was. I saw Prozac. you. I saw you uh, perform stand up. I think this would have been season one of Sunny. I did know this. Yes. I think. It, and was it made me season, want to quit. Yeah. It was in like season one of Sunny, and we were looking for writers. And you and you were um, and I saw you perform. I don't even go out and see that much stand up, but we, for whatever reason, we were there. And I think, I actually think Rogan was there too. I bet improv. This would have been comedy like, store. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and this would have been two thousand four, two thousand five. Wow, this possible? could not have been that good by that time. You were so funny. Thank so you. then I got your information. I don't remember how I got your information, but then I was like begging you to come write for Sunny, and for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Uh, I remember it very specifically, you, and tell me if this was just something that you transitioned, when you transitioned out of this, because I find it fascinating, you, you held the microphone in a very specific way. <laughs> you, I'm gonna do it with this mic, it might mess it up a little bit, but you it, held it like this. It's also how you hold a dick. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, so I just Depending hold the, it the way you hold a dick. Sure, well this is clearly the girth of a penis. Uh, <laughs> So uh, yeah, you held it. You held it like on your fingertips, like this. <laughs> like this. Was that? You, it was very specific, and I was like, "That is a. That's either like a weird choice that's so funny, or she's doing that unconsciously, and that's funny too." It is a weird choice that I used to make because at the time I started doing stand-up, which was which was them, and then we will not talk about me anymore. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, everyone's telling me, you're so strong, you're so raunchy, like you're so powerful, like you need to sort of make yourself more feminine. And I just, I wasn't willing to change my clothes. I wasn't willing to not do the jokes I wanted to do and talk about the things I wanted to talk about or be aggressive and take up space. But I did think it would be funny to be like, like a dainty little girl. Yes. <laughs> like here's my, this is my concession. So anyway, like I would just do it like that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I tried I, I'd it. never heard, I'd never seen anybody hold a microphone like that before. <laughs> Or since. When did you transition out of that? Well, it was once I started becoming a very physical comedian, there was no way. Because mm -hmm. now it's kind of more like a sport to me. Like, it's very physical. I can't wear my hair certain ways because I'm flipping over and I'm back and it's in my mouth. Like, there's just, I'm, it's almost like you're going to work out and I could only use one hand. Mm -hmm. And then also when I started to get more confident. With dicks? With dicks. Yeah. Uh, I'm still not confident with dicks. Okay. Um, but. Uh, and how are we holding those <laughs> at this point? Uh, we don't touch them. Okay, good. Yeah. That's good. No, no, no. We don't hold okay. them. I have a house. I don't have to do that yeah, anymore. Yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> and then, no, I think once I, I started getting confident and realizing, you know, because Sarah Silverman, I mean, the, the people that came before me that I looked up to, I think all had a very sort of like, and it was also cool at the time. There was a big alt scene that was like, you just, you don't touch the microphone, you sit there, you tell your jokes, you don't exert a lot of energy because you're too cool for school mm -hmm. and your, your jokes are on a notebook and you just go, so what else is happening? <laughs> and then you tell like a labyrinth joke. And so, um, I actually think that was a part of, I, I I think you would say like, so what else? So what else? <laughs> well, that means I was yeah, but it was fun, but it was scared. Fun. I was probably scared. Yeah, but it was working. Or I was um, that was a way to have power because it was. I realized very quickly: the faster you go, the more you need their approval. The mm -hmm. more they will not respect you, mm -hmm. and will start to check out. And so I think for me, the what else is happening was like I'm taking my space here, mm -hmm. and I'm not afraid of silence. I think it was kind of that. Well, it worked. Or I and was just I, completely. I, 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 be I begged you to, to, to write for Sonny, and um, 
I don't think you turned me down. I think it was just like, oh, well, let's keep talking. And then it was a scheduling Something thing. Something like, and yeah. then we connected again because you were going to have super fans come in to yes. the writer's room. Yes, that was after the party. That was way, oh, that was like eight yeah. years later. Yeah. We wanted to do something for like, what we thought was gonna be the final season was have a couple of like, like killers come in that we knew who were like fans over the years and come in and I write. remember you called me and I pulled over to the side of the road. Yeah. And like sat there and I was like, it, it was like so surreal. Yeah, and then so that cool. didn't work out for some reason. And then. So I've tried. <laughs> no, I've tried. <laughs> I've tried. Then there was another thing <laughs> that I asked you about. And then, but you were running Roseanne or something like that at the time. Yeah, and that went great. Yeah. Obviously, I made the better choice. It did go great. Thanks. I mean, I don't know what it was like emotionally, um, physically, or how, how, it, how, how it affected your, your mental health. However, the show was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I want to talk it. about this because I think so, I always try to not ask the questions everybody else asks. I see you uh, was looking at all your interviews. Every question was like the same thing. And it's just... We're not going to talk about your body. If someone wants to hear about his body, he's talked about it on every other podcast. It, only in Hollywood, like, if I, I couldn't go on a show and somebody be like, so your body, like, you lost all this weight, you gained all this weight. So it's kind of interesting to now see men sexually harassing other men and objectifying yeah. them. It's yeah. kind of like progress in yeah. a way. <laughs> yeah, and I don't, and I think, I think just because of the historical power dynamic, like, I don't feel objectified. And in fact, it's, I can't, I, I don't mind talking about it just because I do find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. and, and Dax and I are constantly discussing it, and so I, men being insecure about their bodies is a win for me. I'm into yeah. it. It's a win for all of us. Yeah, <laughs> and I think what you'll find is that the vast majority of men are insanely insecure about their bodies. They just can't talk about it or don't want to talk about it because, by far, I would say 99.9% .9 of the people who are interested in, in my um, whether I gained a bunch of weight or lost a bunch of weight and want to talk about it, it's all dudes. Yes, All dudes. Women course. could give two flying fucks. I know, and it's also, yeah, they're like, that's just our life all the time. Yeah. They're like, I had to do this crazy regimen, why did you do this? And we're like, yeah, that's just, life has been life for us since we yeah. were teenagers. But it's also kind of interesting to me that if a man, you know, puts on a bunch of weight and loses a bunch of weight, like, they can, like, win Oscars and stuff. And, like, if a woman puts on weight, she just gets fired. She got back, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I want to point out, I didn't win any Oscars or Emmys. <laughs> because, can I, I'm sorry, can I say this? I, I don't give a shit anymore. They're all bought and they're all rigged. Like, what are we doing? It's just like, who's going to put a bunch of money into, you know, those? Yeah. I mean, look. Put I, it in, I'd I, rather put it into the show. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how it all, how it all works. I mm -hmm. will say that, um, you know. I, you were just I'll, nominated for like 20 Emmys. No, that's the other show on Apple. Yeah, on MQ. With yeah, we're talking about with, that. With Sudeikis. Yeah. No, no, the... Ted Lasso was nominated. For, well, we got nominated for a bunch. You of did. Ones, yeah. You got a bunch. Yeah, that's cool. Come on. But the other show's been going on for so long. I know. And it's good. Well, here's the th dude. That show. I, I didn't want to talk too much about it because I know Benton's going to talk about it when he comes. Up. I just my experience with Sunny is so hilarious to me. The the show is already. I mean, it might be my favorite show. I feel weird. I would om I'd usually say that if you weren't around. Uh, the comeback is maybe my favorite show, and then Sun like that. I've watched every episode, but then when I was dating in my 20s and early 30s, it's every guy I've ever dated's favorite show. I think it's every guy's favorite show. And it's like, they think it's like their little secret. And so when they want to get serious, they're like, I want to show you my favorite show. Like, I'm going to show you. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've seen that. And I have to kind of pretend I haven't seen it. And I would say- Why do you have to do that? Well, because, because you don't want to take the wind out of Because they sales. have this thing they want to show me, uh, you know? And they have yeah. this like thing, they think they're teaching me something and they can't really teach me anything else. And you have to navigate the male ego. Yeah, like, yes, sure. It's like when they want to like explain hockey to me or something, I have to be like, oh my God, <laughs> that's ice? Like that was water once? Oh my God. Like I have to kind of just let them have one. Sure. And. Uh, I would say three out of five, the, their favorite episode is Green Man. And that, really? Yeah. Yeah. The, the is that surprising to you? Yeah. I'm, all, I'm always surprised at what seems to connect with the, that fan, with the fan base, which has now, has now grown because our, our demographic has always remained staunchly men and women. And, Tons. And like, I think season seven or season eight was when we transitioned to where more, it was it skewed more female, which is odd. And it, it's, still, it's continued on that trend. Well, cause Caitlin is a legend. Sure. And so, she's not, she's not like, always oh, talking about boys and makeup and this. She, you know, like I, women, we're sick of just these, every character, uh, female character in every show just being like, the housewife or the insecure one or the one that like wants the guy to call her back and the yeah. one who's like a stalker and who's like, can we just drive by my ex-boyfriend's house? Like, who are these people? Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. I, at some point, they, they it, it just sort of, sort of shifted, but it's always remained staunchly 18 people, 18 to 34. Mm -hmm. But the show's been on for f 
it's 15 seasons, but okay. 17 years. So that means it's been like a generation of people that have kind of aged in and then aged out. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think that maybe the reason the guys that I've dated, that's their favorite episode is because they all secretly wanted to be actors. Once something works, you got to beat it into the ground. I so love we it. Keep bringing back why the same not? bits. Why do we do that? That's the thing is like people will go like, like, oh, we already did that. Let's do it again in a weirder way because characters are going to be different two years later. Like, let's yeah. revisit that. Yeah, and when you're doing something for 15 seasons, you have to try to find ways to both, like the, the, the trick, I think, of, of Sonny and, wh and why it's continued uh, to be successful for as long as it has is because we care about it. We yes. still want it to be good. And also because we recognize that uh, that we want to deliver to the audience the same show in a different way mm -hmm. every week yes. so that they don't and I think part of the charm of the show is that you never know what the fuck you're going to get yep. but that and sometimes that upsets people so we'll do a weird ass episode and then the fan base like hates it but I think that even subconsciously there's something that they enjoy about it because they're like, I I'm not gonna get the same joke every, that's right. every single time. That's right. And that's the, I think that's the way that we approach the show. And I don't think there's anything wrong with approaching it a different way. Like one of my, my favorite shows of all time uh, is Golden Girls. Probably like top three <laughs> of my favorite it, shows. that show. And you could take, and it still holds up, mm -hmm. and you can watch, I watch them with my kids now on, on Lifetime. <laughs> that's so and cool. Then, yeah, and, and, and we watch them and I'm realizing like, oh yeah, you could take out every, almost every single script of Golden Girls mm -hmm. and just, and just as a template and then just erase the, the, the specific of the joke, but take the, but take the intention of the joke. Mm -hmm. Blanche says something sexy. Sophia is the wild card. Rose says something dumb. And every episode is essentially the same, but for whatever reason, the genius of the writing, the genius of those actors, they made it feel both comfortable and surprising week to week. I don't know if this is gonna get me in trouble, but I almost uh, split with someone buying the Golden Girls house. It was for sale. What? Why? I've I, done that with I, you. I, 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 it's the, I know where that is because I walk by it quite often. Really? Because remember, it was yes. for sale. Yes. And they're doing um, uh, Lando Entertainment. They do that. They did the Brady Bunch house thing. They're gonna restore basically the Golden Girls house yes, to exactly what the amazing. set was. And I almost did it, and then I was just like. I, I too almost did it. Kate, my, I, 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 I talked about it with Caitlin quite a bit, and then we were trying to think like, wow, how can we justify this? But if we can go, go in, in with, with go somebody, with somebody and then they're going to restore it in the TV show. So let me, yes. I'm going to ask them. Yeah. You can just, you should just shoot a couple study episodes in there, like not at all acknowledging. It'd be amazing. <laughs> like that's just someone's house. Well, <laughs> but like that's kind of the beauty of, I, I don't know, when I was a kid and I would watch that show, I would watch that with my with my mom, who I, I would see every other weekend. So we would go there and like Saturday nights were like, that was the, the best because we watched the Golden Girls. And then, and then like growing up, um, like, California, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. it was just a completely different, like those women actually existed somewhere in Florida. Yeah. The idea that there were people making a television show is like surreal to me. Then you come out here mm -hmm. and you start seeing like that, that even just the exterior of that house yeah. is not in Florida. Why wouldn't they even have shot that in Florida? <laughs> What the fuck? It's just they because never, it's too human. It's, it's too yes. human. So they just went to that neighborhood and they sh then they sh shot that and then they sh and then the fact that they built the set on this stage here Crazy. and and now I live my Betty White is my neighbor. My neighbor. Insane. It's crazy. It's crazy. crazy. And we have like she's so sweet and we leave things for her and she call. <laughs> we have conversations on the phone and like over COVID. Um, I would love to see her ring camera footage of people that <laughs> just drop things at yeah. their door. Yeah, because she loves animals more than people. Yeah. And so what we do is we, 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 we send photos of the animals. Like we send photos of the kids, but we cut the kids off and it's just the animals. So like, and then what then we, kid looked yeah. most like what animal? Which one kind of like was like, hmm, not too far off. Yeah, um, my oldest son Axel looks kind of like the cat, I would say. If they had to, yeah. But, but what we do is like we'll put them in a, like a group, and then those are the pictures we'll send to like our parents. And then when we send them to Betty, we just like crop the kid out, and I think she appreciates like <laughs> not having to see the, the person because I don't because she'd much rather see the animal. Well, because now that you're here, I want to talk to you about this because. Part of the reason I love your work so much, I always felt like I had to choose. You know, I, I always loved watching Roseanne growing up because it was super, super funny, hardcore jokes, jokes, things that were inherently funny, pathos at the end. And you, it was everything. It was everything. You would laugh, you would cry. They did the episode where DJ wouldn't ki kiss the black girl to school play. Like they did all these, the, the, uh, um, uh, the lesbian kiss. Um, it's not Sandra Bullock, it's... 
Uh, Sandra Bernhardt. Bernhardt. And, um, and so all these things that it was like, I was learning, I was laughing, I was crying that when Jackie came in and her boyfriend beat the shit out of her, mm -hmm. like that, that moment, you know, but I also just love straight up dumb shit sometimes. Like yeah. I want to be the most clever at everything, but sometimes I just love dumb shit. And it, it, I love watching your shows and, and just recently Mythic Quest because there are a couple things that are just like, like silly physical comedy that I miss so much. Like um, Three's Company was my uh, sort of, that was my shit. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, is there anything that's like your indulgence that's like, like I love a, you know, there's, um. Uh, him trying to get into a hammock is the funniest thing ever, John Ritter. There's uh -huh. a five minute video of him uh, uh -huh. on the internet of him just trying to get into a hammock and, he, and it's so brilliant. When people fall, I think it's funny. Yeah. I have such a juvenile side to me. Yeah. You know, is yeah. there anything that you're like? Yeah, well, I mean, to me, one of the top five best moments of Sonny um, is just straight up slapstick humor uh, yeah. where my wife <laughs> is in a shoe store and she comes stumbling out of a shoe store yes, and fucking yes. slams her head into the side of a car <laughs> and dents the shit out of it. And if you track it and you know, notice, like we were not a big production at that point. There's no visual effects there. That is her doing it. And there was a stunt woman on, on set with us and she did one too, but Caitlin's like, no, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And we were like, uh, oh, okay. So, she, she, I so, want to die. I want to get off the yeah, show. So she She's the did guy it. in a dress. She did it and fucking and nailed it. And if you go back and watch that episode, there's no trickery. Like she actually does stumbles, falls down, and cracks and dents that car. That is so wild. It's wild. It's wild. And so <laughs> that that kind of humor to me <laughs> just still like totally works. And so we do that in Mythic Quest as well. Every once in a while, we'll just do something that's just so silly and stupid. And even though Sunny tonally. Uh, it sort of lines up more with Sunny tonally. Uh, Mythic Quest is a different kind of show. Every once in a while, I just we just can't help ourselves. I just I love that shit. There's this like nice like respite for like juvenile comedy. It's just and sometimes it doesn't make any sense. So like we have we have something happen in the second season where and just one of the writers pitched it and we were like yeah, like it's a it's definitely a bit. It's a gag. It has nothing <laughs> to do with the rest of the scene. It doesn't tie in thematically. It's literally just a comedy bit and it's. Um, Charlotte, uh, ca uh, Charlotte's character Poppy, has been sitting cross-legged on. Oh, a, I on laughed table. out loud. Yeah, but yeah. then she was such a genius. I'm so curious how many takes uh, she did. Also, just the um, when she has to sit in the beanbag chair to talk to that yeah. kid, like dumb shit that's just like humiliating and so human. And um, when she fell, she was like screaming, yeah. <laughs> like it still hurt. Yeah. Like it just went on. So, uh, in real time, in your yeah, in real and time. I remember, and we don't get a lot, a ton of notes because actually the studio is like really in support of the show. But I remember getting a few like, "Hey, can you just shorten that?" And I was like, "Nope, nope, that's the thing." No, nope. no, that's we're not going to shorten that. The longer it goes on, the better. If in fact, if we shorten it, then it's just not going to be funny. There was a comedian named Josh Fada in L.A., and he was really physical comedian. He was just like always be out of breath, like running on stage. Like he would just do weird experimental shit. And one time he did this bit where he was like started running, and for the first minute it was pretty funny, and then the second minute it was like, okay, buddy, like what are we, like mm -hmm. okay, what are we doing? Like all comedy is a nightmare. Like maybe mm -hmm. cut the Adderall. What, what's up? Third minute, people are leaving. They're yeah. getting up and leaving. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Minute four. We are laughing so hard. I don't even know the biological basis for mm -hmm. laughing at something mm -hmm. like that. Crying, bawling, crying. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how did he know? How did he get through that minute and then that third minute and know that the fourth was going to be uh -huh. that magical? And then thing? knowing when, uh, and I don't know the, 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 what happened there, but like knowing when, when it's over. How do you know when it's over? It's yeah. so fast. It's a gut. I mean, it's yeah. an instant. That, yeah. Yeah. have to know but I love that and she just like fell straight forward it mm. was it was very um John Cleese or something it yeah. was like instead of because a lot of people would be inclined to maybe like catch themselves she just knew it to go board straight and just fall she kind of looks like a Muppet like the way she doesn't look like a Muppet she acts like a Muppet yeah sometimes. her body yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. and so we write to that well we, so we realized that season one and so we started writing to that season two so I'm obsessed with uh Mythic Quest we will keep talking about Sunny in and out but I want to ask you some questions okay. that uh because did you see the video I sent you where my boyfriend and I yeah, argued? Yeah, it was it was, wonder, it was wonderful. I, I Caitlin and I watched it twice, and I was like, I don't even know what she's talking about. I this have so theories. Okay. Isn't it so weird when someone comes up to you and has a huge theory about something you yes. made, but they think they're right about it? Yeah, but the thing is, you are right about it. That's what I love. Like I, uh, I, I truly mean mean that. Like just because I put it out doesn't mean that I'm right. Like we have an intention of what you put out, but then however someone is receiving it is up is up to them. It's no longer my business. It's become like a Rorschach test. Yes. Yeah, so if you say, if you ask me, uh, is, is that what it is? I'm going to say, is that, is that what you want it to be? Cause that's what, then what it is for you. 
If you ask me if that's what I was intending, I'll give you the honest answer. Okay. Okay. So, the episode after the episode where CW and Rachel are talking about to slow down to have story. Slow down and wait and watch the story when the horse is dying. I'm not doing the spoiler alert thing. I do spoilers. Uh, I do not believe, is that, you don't? Uh, no, I, I do. At a certain point, like, you're either gonna, like, watch it or don't. If you believe the entire world should not talk about a show because you haven't seen it yet, you're fucking spoiled. So I'm gonna talk about it. Um, I get this whole thing, is like, stop, stop. I'm like, no, you. We got rid of that in the writer's room. I, where it, I think we had a, I think it was a show that had been on for like eight months or something, you know, <laughs> up on Netflix. And we were just like, fuck you guys. Like, <laughs> leave the room. We're, ta we're talking about it. Like when Star Wars came out and it was like, so Han Solo, he dies at the end. Everyone's like, come on, man. It's been two years. Yeah, yeah. Like, this yeah. is on you now. Um, so when, because uh, I also am fascinated by that show because I guess this is what I'm putting onto it. So much of it feels like being in a writer's room. So much of it is, I feel like, a metaphor, uh, if, at least for me. And uh, so when CW said, don't fast forward through the story, you got to stay for the story, even though action might stop, uh, and then the horse is dying and it's emotional and Rachel starts crying and she's mm -hmm. moved and whatever. Then the next episode you did was a standalone episode with Kristen and yep. Jake. Yep. And as soon as I realized I wasn't going to see Ian or Poppy, I got a little bit of an itch. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, let me just, I went, you know, I'll, I'll watch this one later because it's a standalone. I can watch it anytime. So let me just finish all the A stories for this and then I'll go back and watch this later, like a little mini movie. And I was like, oh my God, that was the theme of the last episode. Don't fast forward to the story. And then Alex came down, my lover, my handmaid, and he was like, no, that's not it at all. It's a metaphor for the entire show. And I was like, no, the show's a metaphor. That's not a thing. I was like, you're a doctor. You stay out of this. I'm a writer. I know how this works. You don't write a metaphor for a show. You write the show, and the show has themes and can have metaphors. But it's so obvious, because the episode before this was about this. Mm -hmm. Anything? I want to see it the way you, I want to receive it the way you intended. Yeah, so uh, we approach Mythic Quest in a completely different way than we approach Sunny, mm -hmm. which is that with Sunny, we have sort of like a macro understanding of what the show is that developed over time. Mm -hmm. And then we just write what we think is the funniest episode based on putting the whatever happens to be popular in Western culture through this like very bizarre prism and like meat grinder of the point of view of the show. Mm -hmm. And then we just put that out. Uh, and with Mythic Quest, it's completely different. We approach that show um, as uh, almost like thematically first, mm. where we say like, what are the interest, what are the things that are interesting to us? Mm -hmm. Um, what are the things we want to talk about every day in the writer's room? Yeah. And not necessarily always laugh, which is with Sonny, we have really in-depth conversations um, because we can't fuck that show up. We, we, we walk such a razor thin line that we got to make sure that- Your, your fans own you. Yeah. Well, well, and <laughs> also, it is and, a religion. And also people who aren't fans, uh, we can recognize, look, you're never going to change somebody's mind, but we have to make sure that we're being respectful of whatever the subject is that we're satirizing right, right? right, right. so that's a really that's a really important role in satire is making sure that you're that you're being respectful of all sides that you're never punching down that you're that you're trying to say something that um at, that that at least um whether it should or shouldn't be said uh that at least should be part of the conversation right. because it's a part of the cultural zeitgeist i was trying to look up how many hours of uh it's always sunny have been made I can tell you how many have been watched because they we got that stat last uh, you mean last year. total of ever I was just like if someone to start watching it now how many hours would it take to watch the whole thing uh, because these are people that have given you hundreds of hours of their lives I mean it's like it's yes. so wild to think about um, we last year they told us that two billion hours of Sunny had been watched which is crazy what happens when you hear that <sighs> I wonder. I yeah I don't know I it's a it, it's a st it's such a staggering number. But do you kind of just go push it down, push it down, can't process? Like I'm just gonna keep going. I don't want that to fuck with my head. It like, doesn't fuck with my head. Okay. Because the show doesn't feel like um, to me, it's never felt like a big hit because it isn't a big hit. It's it's become a hit in the aggregate, mm -hmm. but it's there was never a moment where we were like uh, a talked about sh show ever. And I mean, in the comedy community, I guess we talk about it so much. I mean, to the point to where it's like you have a bit you want to do and they're like, ah, oh, fuck, they kind of did that on Sunny. 
damn it. Like, yeah, it's talked about a lot. That's cool to hear, and I love hearing... I mean, we don't like... We're mad at you. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, it's not... Like, we don't like you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I love hearing that when people are like, oh, in our writer's room, you know, we even on dramas and things like that, we talk about Sonny for the first 15, 20 minutes, and then, we, and, then, and then we'll continue on with whatever the story is. And that obviously feels really good, but I'm not mm -hmm. in those rooms. I can't feel that or hear that. Yeah. And then when we premiered the show... It was like a good five or six years before, uh, before social media. Mm -hmm. So there was no way to tell whether or not people were watching it or caring or anything. So I had no feedback what, whatsoever and until we started doing the live show. Yes, yeah. which is also a good thing. I'm yeah. not complaining about it mm -hmm. because in some ways we were just working in a vacuum, and then that created what our um, what our process became and then c continues to be to this day, which is if it makes us laugh, that's the only thing we care yep, about. Yep, yep, yep. That's it. And do you have any, like, dumb writer's room jokes? Like, just dumb ones that no one would know, that like a, uh, like a, like a inside joke that's been going on this whole time. You know, like, like the dumb ones, you know, mo a lot of writer's rooms do is, you know, when it's uh, regarding RE, you know, uh, and then there'll be a, is that a semicolon? What's the thing that's two uh -huh. dots on top of each other? Uh -huh. And then, um, Ray Mark, right? Ray Mark, and then and then people go like, ah, oh, he's not available. Like just stupid. It's so yeah. dumb, but we say it to make fun of the people that would say that, and the, you know, or like the Who Jackie in the Roseanne. Uh -huh. You know, that's uh -huh. a big one. Anytime Who Jackie. So it's, are there any that just like for Sunny Dorks? Um, I can tell you that um, for years and years and years, um, one of the things that we would say is. <laughs> La uh, there's already like, laughing. Already laughing. There, there's a, already uh, laughing. Don't there's an know. episode that we want to do. Like you know, you come in the first, you, the, in, the first day, and you're like, okay, I want to do an episode about this. What about this? What about that? What about this? And then I don't know. Starting season like, sit five. Maybe. Mm -hmm. We were like, I was like, I, I want to do an episode that takes place entirely in a water park, like just <laughs> just a water park. And then we break the rest of the season, and then we'd be like, like final episode, uh, the water park thing's not really working. And then the next year, we'd be like, okay, we want to do this episode, this episode, this episode. And I want to do that water park one. And then the and then I think it was finally season. You might be able to look it up, twelve or something, right. where. I was like, okay, and then of course we have to do the water park, and then and then for whatever reason, maybe because we ran out of other ideas, <laughs> we were like, fuck it, and we just put it up there, and we decided that we were gonna break the story, and it became like one of the favorite, one of the best episodes of Sunny we ever did. Wow! And for ten years, it was always just sitting up on, on the whiteboard. <laughs> Should yeah. we do it in your water park episode? Like yeah. always. <laughs> yeah, it was always like, uh, yeah, date all right, Rob, let's do the fucking, yeah. let's do the, wa the water park. <laughs> like, what are we gonna do at a water park? And by the way, the story that we broke is insane, but it, it, it seemed to work. Because uh, I was thinking about Mythic Quest. I do, in the next season, believe they should have to be in charge of building the amusement park version of Mythic Quest. That's a good pitch. I know. That's a really good pitch. Yeah. So I like, also think, that, what about the, uh, there's going to have to be episodes of when they want to make the movie version and then real actors come in and audition. Like real, as them. Ryan yeah. Reynolds comes in and auditions for the Masked Man. Role of, for the role of, yeah, yeah. For the role of Ian. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Who would, who would audition for the role of Ian that... Ryan couldn't pull it off. I think you're, no, he's not strong enough. Can I tell you my little Ryan Reynolds story? Sure. I never, I've, I've sort of seen him around. Well, first of all, he was a married, married to Alanis Morissette at some point, so he's always cool with me. But... When I was in college in Philadelphia, I worked for the UPenn television station. It's a big, the Nielsen ratings were through the roof. Mm -hmm. And I, for some reason, they were like, hey, Ryan Reynolds, he's the star of this movie called um, Lampoon's yep. College, whatever. He's been on Van a- Van Wilder. Van Wilder, yep. shit. Uh, and he's on a show called Two Guys and a Girl in a Pizza Place. Mm -hmm. And we need you to interview him. The fact, whoever his publicist was, the yeah. fact that they allowed this to happen, I hope they have been fired and are making. I see the crossover though. Van Wilder was about a university. college yeah, time. College. Yeah, they but wanted to get. The I went in. into his hotel room mm. at the Four Seasons in, in Philadelphia. Yeah. Okay. In Philadelphia, already there was someone there. Or whatever. Um, no, by the way, not you and Ryan. The two people I've never felt any weirdness with ever. It was he was. We're just, the only two people. Probably. Wow. Probably. Wow. You're like Vern Troyer. You know what I mean? I mean, there are a couple people that I haven't had a ton of chemistry with, but but you don't, at least there was no like. You don't give off the creep vibe. There was no like, oh, is this weird? It was just like, we're here to work. Hi, nice to meet you. Like, it was like, you could shake my hand. There's women, we just know. And it's yeah. it's really hard to explain also, and it makes us seem crazy. It's like the uh, the long hug. You know, we can tell you exactly how long was too long. We can, 
and it's we talk about this all the time. This is the exact kind of thing we put into Mythic Quest. Yeah, yep. all because yep. it's so fascinating to us and to my partner Meg very specifically because these like because workplace dynamics is thematically interwoven with. I mean, look, I, I don't want to tell you you're wrong, oh, but, but you're wrong. No, I, I couldn't even but follow what, what you were talking about. It would have been better if that was the intention. Wait, do you want in me? the video that you okay. sent me, which okay. you should put up into the show. I sent this video to you. Yeah. And this was right as I was binging your show. Yeah. My lover, my yeah. ignorant young lover. So you're telling me. You have to see it though. That after an episode where the big lesson is don't skip through the emotional story parts, the next episode is an emotional story part similar to the horse dying, but you don't think that is why they put the episode there. No. <laughs> no water to that theory. It's not that there's no water, it's that you're missing the point. How? You're not wrong, you're just partially right. How do you know? What's your ver uh, version? That it's a metaphor for the whole series? Yeah. Okay, everything's a metaphor for everything. But well, don't you true. think they put this episode after the episode where the whole lesson was don't miss the power of story, the power of story, and then I found with the next episode, I didn't see Ian, I didn't see all my friends. Up for 30 minutes and learn about a new story. But how do they know I'm binging it? Everyone binges everything. Okay. It came out in 2020. I thought I made generalizations. Uh, but okay. It came out in 2020. Everyone binges everything. Also, even if you don't binge it, you're still going to appreciate. You don't think it's a coincidence that there was an episode where the beast. They told you to shut the fuck up and don't hit fast forward for 30 minutes? Yes, I don't think it's a coincidence. I agree. And then I saw two brilliant actors that I love, but it was like, oh, this is like a standalone episode, yes. and Ian's not in it, and I want to see the rings on all of his fingers, and I want to see what happened. Yes. Um, with Poppy and, yes. the, and Dana, because she just got keep, a promotion. You keep wanting. And to then see they it. went to someone else, and I was like, oh, I got to get back, and I started fast forwarding, yeah, and I was like, oh my God, this is just what the minutes, guy told me not they to give do. give you 30 minutes of what could happen over five or 10 seasons. Seasons. It's the whole point. This is your show is going to break us up. So thanks. Also, what are your credentials gonna, uh, the, as a writer? I'm going to tell you this: the vet is nailing it. <laughs> no. Yeah. See, this makes me think I can never enjoy shows as a comedy writer. Mm -hmm. It's like he gets to do it. I, I'm so jealous of the people that don't make comedy. They get to watch it and just enjoy it. I can't believe Sir. I said that. <laughs> I, I have never spilled way, no. a glass of goddamn water in my life, especially not on a. I'm, I'm so uh, uh, glad that happened. When Dr. Davidson Claire was on the show, I spilled an entire coffee uh, on myself. Uh, I am so sorry. I shouldn't why, have. Why are you have, sorry? I should have given you a different. By the way, this is I, something. Because I, I should have made it a baby bottle with a nipple. This is something we talk about <laughs> on Myth, in the Mythic Quest Writers Room quite a bit too. Uh, again, workplace dynamics. I Do you just need spilled. Pants? We have no, pants. Fine, we have sweatpants. I spilled a bottle of water on your <laughs> table and on myself and on yeah, your but chair, it's and because, you apologized because to you're me. a big like Hulk now, and you can't control your. You're just like a big. And animal. now you're apolog. Now you're complimenting me. You're, you're a big creatined up fucking. No lug. creatine for me. Okay, sorry. I'll get us back on the rails. Oh please. Um, <laughs> so that your producer doesn't shoot you. Um, that you're the vet is correct. That you're you're partially right insofar as the whole show is 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 woven together based on very specific thematics. Right. However, the specificity of what you're talking about is unintentional, but that doesn't mean that it didn't um, that it wasn't effective for you because it's still saying the same things that we're trying to say. So it's genius, and then also accidentally genius on top of that. Do you yeah, know but, but that, that shit is? happens all the time where yeah. you're like, oh, I wasn't intending for this to be the case, but they think that I was, and so therefore, the less I say about it, the better. Or it was like some subconscious thing that you just. But no, but again, why like, did you put that episode there? Because, because maybe again, maybe it was subconscious, like you said. Because we're th these are the kinds of stories that we're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. Even just the idea that, because um, I've heard that we we do a bunch of those kinds of episodes where we tell the story in a different way, mm -hmm. and people will call them like, oh, those are departure episodes or those Bottle. are standalone yeah. episodes, and they're not. 
they, they, it's just a different way of telling the same story. All the and themes, then, yeah. Yeah, and then it all comes back uh, together at the end of that particular season, season one, where the same, where the two uh, characters in the episode are going through the same struggles as the two uh, main characters, Ian and, Ian and Poppy. And so uh, the fact that we're navigating all of that through a, a series of episodes is not, is yes, it's intentional, but then sometimes the specifics are unintentional, but still work. Fascinating. And then I know, um, I don't know where obviously the show is going. I mean, my pitches will obviously um, sure. uh, be in season three, but um, the, I, I really did appreciate the first episode of season two. We'll see if this, what this means, but I appreciated the complete lack of sexual chemistry between Ian and Poppy in the first season. Yeah. Because every network would go, they got a date, they got a date, they got a date. Like Scully and Mulder, it's got to be that. And it was just like so refreshing to go, no, men and women can kind of just work together and not fall in love. Yeah. That's was, what we're doing with the show. Yeah. Were you just like, was there any pressure on you like at any time to sort of cheat or be sloppy about, well, what if they flirted or what if that, you know? No. Never felt that way. No, because, um, because um, f first of all, I mean, I have this relationship with my partner, Megan Gans, and mm -hmm. so I love her. she's the best. Yes. And so um, we work very closely together. We have a very, like, incredibly intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what winds up happening or has historically happen, happened is that people start to conflate, uh, and I don't want to say just male, female. I mean, people uh, of whatever sex who's attracted to the sex that they happen to be working with, mm -hmm. and then they conflate those intimacy, those intimate moments with romantic moments. That's right. So we, certainly the two of us, have developed a, a love for each other. It's like the idea you pitch the same joke at the same time. You know, you're like, in the banana falls. Yes. You were, you were right here this whole time. Yes. It's like, no, and you just, <laughs> you're right, funny. But yet we can, we, what we recognize is like, oh, that makes us great partners mm -hmm. and, I, and we love each other and we, we can be intimate with yeah. each other, but that doesn't have to then take another step People are like, oh, well, then the next step would be this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I mean, truly, I don't know why that's the next step. Mm -hmm. Why does there have to be a You've next step? You've worked with step? a billion women and never, yeah. I, I, exactly. I've worked with a billion men mm -hmm. and we haven't, we've. And we, we haven't had sex. Yeah, yeah like it's we've so shared, true. And we've shared all those same levels of intimacy and love, whether men want to talk about that shit or not. Yeah. That is what happens. And then, and then it doesn't extend into the realm of sexual. So why would that be the case with with a person who I was sexually attracted to mm -hmm. uh, every time. Right. You can separate those two things. Yes. So, um, and, 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 and it's not even like a, like something that we're consciously doing. It's just something that we can, I don't know. I'm so curious if that, that is something that we inherited from movies because that was sort of the plot of so many movies for so long, right? And then I wonder if it's like nature or nurture, if that's something that's just human nature that we kind of, you know, our brains start to have the oxytocin and norepinephrine. If we're like, we just had the same joke. That was so cool. Yeah. Obviously, if it was a girl, we'd be like, high five. Is there something of like, you should procreate with that person because yeah, that person gets you and can raise your child. There's also something, yeah, that's just like a biological imperative, right? So we, I will say that, that for as many accolades as we get for like creating uh, or at least demonstrating a, a very, I don't want to say healthy relationship because it's not a healthy workplace relationship. However, it's healthy insofar as it doesn't, deviate into the romantic, um, that at, at the same time, I recognize that I'd say half of the comments that we get are, when are Poppy and I going to get sure. together? Because people really want it. I just feel like people, they want the characters for as deplorable as they can be. If you're investing your time and effort and energy in watching the show, then you love them to a certain extent yes. and you want them to be happy. Yes. And so you think, oh, they belong together. And I do believe that I and Poppy belong together. Mm -hmm in the same way that I believe that the characters of Sonny belong together. Mm -hmm. um, because, but the difference with them is that no one else will be friends with them. <laughs> and with, and with, with Ian and Poppy, it's I mean, because, you've seen my friends in the hallway of the comedy store, I would. <laughs> yeah, sure. I would. So like, I guess I just feel like that we'll continue to explore that relationship and I don't know where it's, it's going to, where it's going mm -hmm. to go, but I do understand like our our original intention, it continues to be our intention is to is to is to demonstrate something else. Yeah. And then we'll see. But people truly want them to fuck, and I I also think it's creepy because I'm like sixteen years older than her. Or yeah. Well, it's also kind of like a mentor ish relationship, you know. But yeah, it's so fascinating to me because. Um, in my experience, when I'm working on shows and you have an actor or writer that you're like super connected, you know, with, and you're like, 
this is an ephemeral thing. I'm just in love with this show. I'm in love with your brain. And if I do this, I'm just going to blow this whole thing up. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, um, it's. Yeah, but sex, I mean, look, se sex appeal and sex drive and, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, I mean, why do we want to fuck in the first place? It's yeah. like just a biological imperative. For money? So, and also, and right, all, right. There's, there's lots of different reasons. So Certainly he, in this, in this. To city. earn love. Sure. Which is how love is earned. Sure. To, yeah. So can I, we we're talking about like sort of a toxic workplace for a second, which yeah. you sort of alluded to. I, first of all, I have one question, which is, um, I'm gonna ask you a couple of very specific questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, Megan Gans, was the episode about women in, uh, you know, video gaming, the uh, episode where, you know, uh, Poppy had to give the speech and all that. I could not believe how cathartic it was to watch that because uh, there's it's such a perfect critique on this moment. It was really important to us to have the, uh, that scene with David yeah. and her where she's saying you're you're going to that yeah like to show how powerful women are I'm making I'm you making do you something do that yeah. and you're not allowed to say no right exactly for us the way that we wanted to subvert expectation was to have and ultimately be funny and I think ultimately be a little bit more um, effective mm -hmm. was that uh, at the end of the day, she is triumphant, mm -hmm. but that she's triumphant because Ian did really write that for her. Mm -hmm. Because we also, and again, what we try to do is be as honest as possible and to be as authentic as possible and to not virtue signal at all. So mm -hmm. to me, it would have been a loss and it would have been less effective if she went up there and just crushed on her own. Mm -hmm. Because we're presenting a character who is not good at that, mm -hmm. right? The whole point of Poppy is that why is that she's good at, at her job. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have to be good at this other thing. But now she's being asked to be good at this other thing that this guy, Ian, happens to be good at. And that's his thing. Mm -hmm. So if she's then good at his thing too, we just felt like that felt false. In yes. the same way that if Ian was really good at programming all of a sudden, then he wouldn't need her. And I think the, what we're trying to explore is like that people are good at certain things and what they need to and 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 what they need to be good at to to facilitate their particular position their their job uh, isn't necessarily to be able to get up in front of a, a large group of people and perform right which has historically been something that is easier for a person like I am mm -hmm. a man a white man who has had experience after experience whether it's conscious or unconscious from the time he's born where he's told mm -hmm. you deserve a place up on that stage, mm -hmm. talking to people. Everyone wants to hear you talk. Exactly. So that, so that all of a sudden, of course he's. I mean, he, of course he's good at that. She shouldn't be good at that, right? Because she has historically not had the same experience as as he had. Now she could get good at that over yeah. time, or maybe she doesn't. Yeah. Either way, that doesn't make her a better programmer. So then, why should that be celebrated? Right, 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 right. So all that is to say, the idea that he then wrote that speech for her is really important because yes. she then was able to subvert it again by manipulating him mm -hmm. into getting what she wanted. So we're constantly trying to like play with um, the various uh, aspects of these like weird workplace dynamics and what we're talking about now mm -hmm. and then explore them and then subvert them. So this leads me into my question about Ian. Um, and I remember in the first episode being like, I hope his real his name's Ian, it's Ian, it's gotta be Ian, he fucking went with that. Like I just let that, made me so happy. Um, just little tiny things like that, that these, the devils in the details with all of your work, like the tiniest little things I get so excited about. Like um, in the episode where, uh, HR and Rachel were walking back from the car uh, in the parking lot. It was like kind of the first parking lot uh, scene I think I had seen outside maybe. And an extra, a white guy, just walked right through them. Yeah. Who did what, Who did that? Yeah, those are the kinds of things that we're always talking about. Like really sitting on set and working with, we have an incredible amount, uh, incredible, um, bench of, of, of directors and then also the writers like I encourage everybody to be on set and throw in different ideas and then we have Amazing. people from the video game companies there it's a really f free environment because I I really like the idea of like hearing from everybody's perspective and of course like pushing things forward at the same time and so I can't remember exactly who pitched that specific thing but those kinds of details are popping up all the time. Do, but, uh, and by the way, that's the kind of shit that I wouldn't know, right? I would be like, oh, well, no, he's just walking. So let's just have somebody walk by. And then somebody else, probably Megan, was like, no, this motherfucker would walk straight through. And they're invisible to yes, him. Yes. They're invisible. It's a person of color, LGBTQ person, invisible, walks right through, kind of knocks Rachel over. And in order to do that, you're adding time to your day. Reset the M, is that? Like, it was so intentional and so powerful with being completely nonverbal. Yeah. 
Yeah, and th those are the kinds of things that we're always talking about. And that's what's so fun about it for me, because I've been doing this a long time, and so like, why am I, why am I still doing it? What's mm -hmm. like so fun for me? And truly, I, I, it's because I get to go in and, you know, we have writers who, and people who I work with who are, I'm one of the oldest people now at this point, so m mostly so crazy. it's like, I know, it's wild. It's like people in their early 20s, you know, in our, in our, on our writing staff, and then people in their early 30s and late 30s, and so it's like, whatever my generation is, I guess, I guess generation X, tail end of it, and then the millennials and now Gen Z. And so everybody's navigating the world in a different way. Gen Z's never heard of us. They think I'm Joan Rivers. Well, this is what's so fun is because for years, it was like when I was hiring millennials to come in, they were like, hey, old man, like this is the way that things, you know, are, are, are trending, right? This is what we're talking you about. You calling me yellow? And I, and I love that, because I'm like, great, I, I, that's your birthright. Like, you're, the young generation is gonna change the culture, great. Mm -hmm. So I never wanna be that old man who's like, talking about how this generation is the one that fucked it up, because. But I also think we talk a lot about like, sexism and, oh, I thought I was gonna get shot in the head. Uh, we talk about sexism, we talk about obviously racism, all the important stuff, um, homophobia, et cetera, transphobia. We don't talk a lot about ageism though. Yeah. And I know it's kind of to go like, old white guys, give them a break. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say, we, we tend to kind of just throw old people into a thing. You know, they have all, all this interesting wisdom. That's why I love the, the, well, C CW, yes, the CW yeah. character so much. It's like, no one even wants to hear from him. He's got all this. So to me, when really I start working with really young people and Benson and I go through this a lot where I'm just like, I understand, but I was you once too. Yeah. I once thought I was going to clean up all the oceans and I've been around long enough knowing that that's not the way to do it. This is the way to actually have impact. So just, I'm, I'm not in, I, like, yeah. I, I have some things to teach you. But these are the things that we explore. So then Gen Z now in the last four years have entered the workforce and it's really fun to watch the millennials. Yeah, it's really fun to not be able to text them after six. It's fun to, wa to watch the millennials. Don't you miss working weekends? <laughs> it's so like, I didn't, it was so toxic. I didn't even realize yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I actually used to love working weekends. And then when I had kids, like, I, yeah. but, but the, it's fun to watch the Gen Z, the millennials have to, they, they hear what the Gen Zers are talking about and they're like, wait, no, no, no. Like we're the young ones. And I'm like laughing. Cause I'm like, so good. it's all, it's watching them now having to navigate a younger generation. And then Gen Z is going to have to navigate. Cause I think it's, it's, it's tighter. The generations aren't going to be 10, 20 years apart. It's yes. going to be, well, that's what, yeah. It's going to be like two years. Someone who's 22 and 25, yes. the 22 year old already has some new apps sure. that this one doesn't even know about. Sure. And what's so fun for, for, for me and all of us like in the room is Again, we're navigating, nobody, very rarely is somebody wholly right or wholly wrong. Right. So what we're trying to figure out is, okay, like, like you said, where is it that, that I and, or me, for, for, for that matter, a 44, 44 year old man, uh, you know, who's, who's engaging in, I wouldn't say an argument, but like a, 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 a constructive cr criticism on the way a 22 year old is navigating her life. And then where am I crossing a line to where I am like either mansplaining or dadsplaining or whatever it is, or imparting wisdom that they're, right? And so, and then where are they getting it right and where are they getting it wrong? These are the things that we're constantly talking about and sure. what we're trying to put into the show. And that's what's so fun about it for us. I was trying to work on a bit about mansplaining uh, and I did put self tanner on last night and I look insane. Do I look insane? No. Yeah. Okay. I was when I when I, when I, when I, look I just at me. almost knocked this out. I look like I'm in Latina face. Am I gonna get canceled? <laughs> I really hope we don't have to shoot this because I have on Sally Hansen self tanner. This is not what I look like at all. Look, that's the real color of my skin. It's not uncomfortable. Uh, no, I mean you've made it uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> It wasn't uncomfortable That's before. my brand. Yeah. But, um, uh, I'm, the only reason I'm uncomfortable is because, which is, I, I mean, I'm slightly uncomfortable, is because are you? I feel like, well, no, I want to do, I want this to be entertaining. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes I, like when I listen to your podcast, you're laughing a lot. And so are the guests. And so. Yeah. And when I have sex, I'm having orgasms sure, a lot. Sure. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know if people tune in to your podcast to hear people like pontificate about television writing. And no, that's what I'm afraid I'm doing. This is so interesting because I didn't start a podcast for, I was like the last person that started a podcast. It was like completely against my will. I was like, I don't know how to just talk for two, three hours. I need to write something down, practice it, rehearse it, rewrite it. I mean, and for stand up, you have eight months to practice it. This whole thing, and we just like go out and start randomly like having, com I'm not that funny in person, you know, like I kind of been a serious person. So I, but I think it's, I finally realized people just want to hear what you have to say. It doesn't matter how you're saying it. 
Yeah, I, one of the things that I hear more often than not, once people feel, once once I meet somebody and they feel comfortable enough with me, yeah. one of the first things they'll say about me is that I thought you'd be funnier. They're like, uh, you're funny on the show, but you're not funny in real life. And I, yeah, like, I think yeah. that's accurate. Yeah, well, okay, when I meet doctors, I'm not like, I thought you'd be covered in blood. We're yeah. at this party. Like, that's not... I, I, I've accepted it. It's not something, because I... I I don't know. Maybe I. But it's just... part of why, I, if I may, it is all. Uh, I, it is also, I believe, why you're such a fucking incredible actor. Shit. Sorry, we just got demonetized. Um, but uh, well, we can't curse. Because we can. It By the way, I, I did care. notice that. It I said don't care. Rating clean. I was like, <laughs> wait a second. Whitney has a podcast. That's yes, and then it's I don't, about it's yeah. But then the, the ones I was listening to, at least the subject matter is. No, getting, I'm the new Dave Coulier. Okay. I'm a I'm a Christian comic now. Okay. Um, where was I going? Where was I going? Oh, par, par, when I watch you act, it blows. And I know you guys crack up, but uh, you know after taste and stuff. But you play things so straight, and especially with Ian, it that I feel like your demeanor and essence as a person is part of why you can uh, play because that's my favorite kind of comedy the Niels, the um leslie nielsen like he was a leslie nielsen was a drama actor mm -hmm. you know john goodman was in play like i think someone that has a serious personality is always the funniest i i mean i'm just like trying to steal as much as i can from the people who i think are the funniest mm -hmm. and so can i ask who like who growing up like who did you watch and like the first I, mine was i'll give you a second to think mine was um uh uh three's company mm -hmm. Married with Children, Martin. Best. Yeah, well, classics. Yeah, well, we were. So I'm a little older than you, I think, but I'm. But I was. We were watching TV at the same time. Yeah. So, um, I, I would say that I never intended to get into comedy, like legitimately. Mm -hmm. And I was when I f even first started acting. I was just going out for drama stuff, and mm -hmm. then comedies. I started auditioning for comedies and never get, getting any of those roles. Mm -hmm. um, but then, but then I would meet people like Charlie Day and be like, Well, I'm never going to get a job if this fucking guy's out here. And <laughs> And, and then, like, if Caitlin's, obviously, I'm not going off for the same parts as Caitlin, but she's legitimately a, an unbelievably funny person, as is Glenn, it's Danny, amazing. who's just naturally funny. Um, and so I, that was never my... But Glenn was Juilliard actor. Yeah. Wasn't he drama? Mm, yeah, but r for right off the bat, he started booking every audition he went out for because he can make something real and funny. Yeah. And then, and then I was sort of like in the beginning learning from them. I just wanted to work. So I just wrote something that I thought was really dark and funny to me and then they really made it funny and then I was just holding on for dear life. <laughs> but when I see somebody like, um, you know, you, you see somebody like Will Ferrell, right? And you're yep. like, well, you're just born like that. I, no one's gonna. But he's playing everything pretty straight. Yes, also a person who's not funny in real life. But exactly. Even though you look into his eyes and that's always kind of funny, yes, but Steve then you're Carell, having a same thing. First time I met Steve, Steve Carell, Carell's not, yeah, he was he's like just a sweetheart. sweetheart. Yeah. And I was just like, what? Yeah. You know, like. And Will's really shy. Yes. And not, he doesn't, he's not there to perform for nope, you. Nope, nope, nope. And so you walk away going, wow, what a sweet man. But you're not thinking, oh, that's the fucking But also, guy what you're that. doing now is making me look up to you even more because you're, uh, it's taking me so long to not always like be on and always have to like be a clown and impress people and be funny all the time. You know, it, it's just actually a, a joy for me. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I have people on that aren't funny all the time. I had Burt Kreischer on, I had Bobby Lee on, I had. Um, Burt Kreischer's funny. I'm, jo I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, I don't I've know. Had, what you know. About. <laughs> um, we now interrupt me talking to Rob to talk about Stitch Fix. Emily, before we talk about Stitch Fix, mm -hmm. I'm going rogue here. Oh God. I would like to address the fact that people think I have three assistants. I do not. You Will do you not. tell people what your job is? I am, well, do you tell me what my job <laughs> is? <laughs> You're my caretaker and uh, emotional support system. I have a vest. Yeah. <laughs> and Grace is our chief of staff here. You are the showrunner. Yes. And I, so we're about to talk about Grace struggling to find me clothes for my uh, press events. Right, right, right. And, and I, I remember this because as when I was your assistant, right. we would get your looks together, wardrobe together. But you know what I'm realizing? What I'm realizing is that at, both you, Grace, and Benton have all been and in an assistant position at yes. some point. Yes. And the main focus of that job is just to get me clothes that I can wear that have horses on them that I don't sweat in. Yes. That's that, the main job. That was actually in the job description. And I heard there have been some issues. Grace is having issues. Yes. And I, I want you to watch this video because I think it'll give you a good idea of what, what she's dealing with. Huh. Okay. 
here we go. Okay, Whitney's got a big event tonight, and I don't know what to send her out the door in because all she owns is horse shirts. Horse blazers, she definitely bought on uh, final sale. Horse dresses that are the color of uh, cat's puke. Black and white horse dresses to emulate fashion icon John Wayne. Not into page six. Horse pants. I forgot about that. Abstract horses. Horse cape. Patterned horses. Pasture. More horses. That's my comedy shirt. Horses in motion. Okay, she's officially lost it. I can't hide the fact that she made another worst dress list from her, so I don't know what to do. Jesus. Okay. Um. Oh, new Stitch Fix box just came in. I mean, there has to be something in here that she can wear. This is promising. Oh, this blue will look so good with her blue eyeliner that she always wears. <laughs> What's and that the fabric's not going to wrinkle for when she inevitably decides to sit in someone's lap. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to find an incinerator for this, and uh, <laughs> I'm still going to have to let her wear, like, a horse necklace or horse earrings or, like, on. horse sneakers, but honestly, Stitch Fix truly saved the day with this one. She's going to be dressed like a normal person. Oh, that's... Stitch Fix, I love you. Okay, yes, I have a horse shirt addiction, and something happens when you think you look good in something where you just keep buying the same thing. So Stitch Fix did send this. It is a beautiful, it is like a royal blue dress that I never would have picked out myself. Right. That is, it's almost like half Meghan Markle, half the other one. Oh. Okay. Meghan Middleton. Kate, Kate Middleton. Kate Middleton. The it's other, like classy. The other one. I wouldn't have thought to buy this myself. So right. like Stitch Fix did did nail it. Right. And can I tell you, this Stitch Fix, will you explain what the what they do? Okay, yes. As so, I'm pulling out the cute stuff they sent us. So Stitch Fix offers clothing hand selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget. You try on pieces at home before you buy, you keep what you love, and you return what you don't. And I know what you're gonna say right now. What? That I'm saying it like an ad. <laughs> I was just thinking I that, know. but I didn't. I thought oh. it, and then I said, don't say that. Well, as I was saying it, I said to <laughs> because myself. Because when you talk to me, you're like, hi. And then when you're talking about Stitch Fix, you're like, Stitch Fix. Da -da -da -da. You turn into. I just want, I want our sponsors to know that we're taking this seriously. I know, and you're trying to talk as cute as these tops are. Oh. So here's what's amazing Impossible. about Stitch Fix. I was worried because I was like, okay, you know, because you do take a quiz that, you know, I was worried that the quiz was going to make them send me ugly clothes, mm -hmm. <laughs> like horse clothes. So you cheated on the but Stitch no, Fix but, quiz? <laughs> but Stitch Fix, they, they obviously, um, they will not let you be left to your own devices. Like something happened in the quiz where they were like, we're not going to send you that. Right, right, right. Um, because that's what you would wear. We and know the whole, better Yeah, you. the whole point is we're going to buy you things right. that, that you wouldn't think to buy. Uh, to buy. But this, can I tell you, they sent me this Rails plaid shirt. I wear these Rails plaid shirts all of the time and they sent me the one I don't have. They must watch the show. But it is the cutest one. That is the cute. I love those. Because I always mm -hmm. buy like dark colors, black, mm -hmm. navy, and they sent me this sort of like, yeah. um, it's pink and kind of like a soft teal. Yeah. I've never even seen this one. So no, I haven't either. They sent me the better version of something I already like. Yeah. Oh, it's and soft? It, yeah, I know. That's so cute. And then this is something they sent. It's this floral top. I would never think to buy this, but it is so cute because whenever I have like an important meeting, I have like vintage t-shirts mm -hmm. and our merch mm -hmm. and that's it mm -hmm. so this is like a very good like zoom meeting shirt i'll take that so stitch fix sends you stuff that you can't be tacky it mm -hmm. will not let you be tacky or trashy no matter how hard you try they will not send you stuff that's going to embarrass you at the barbecue so or get, them <laughs> get started today at stitchfix.com slash whitney you'll get 25 percent off when you keep everything in your fix that's stitchfix.com i wouldn't return any of that no, I wouldn't either. In fact, I mean, I'm going to keep all the I, Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be able to because you're going to take it all. <laughs> Stitchfix.com slash Whitney for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash Whitney. It says dot com. I know. I <laughs> <laughs> So as y'all know, BetterHelp is one of our sponsors. And as you probably assume, Emily basically keeps them in business. I, I use our promo code. I personally <laughs> love, th it would be so dark if you didn't, just to like prove a point. <laughs> <laughs> to not give you the credit. <laughs> like if you're like, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna pay the extra and not use promo code Whitney, cause I'm not codependent. <laughs> <laughs> I love therapy. We all know this. I talk about it a lot. You know, I talk about ancestral trauma. I talk about psychology. I talk about all the work I've done on myself. The only thing that I feel like we can improve in therapy in general is that when someone goes to therapy, the therapist is only hearing the patient side of the story. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you're, yeah, you're do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you're not here. Like, I, when my boyfriend goes to couples therapy, I kind of want to be like, 
well, you're not going to tell him all the things he needs to hear because mm -hmm. you don't think you did anything wrong. Right. right. So, I, you know, so I am at the point where I feel like I've so dissolved my ego and I'm, I don't take criticism as personal attacks. Like, I can That's receive beautiful. feedback yeah. without feeling attacked without taking it personally i'm i feel like i'm enlightened at this point and okay. i i wanted to get to take my therapy to the next level okay. i wanted to give my employees a chance to weigh in i wanted grace and emily to let me know what you think i should relay to my therapist like what my blind spots might be like what i need to work on do you um, have any I, thoughts to my boss, so, do I want to give my boss? Yeah, let feedback. me know what. You like, what are my flaws? Like, what should I work on in therapy, in your opinion? Uh, do you have it? Uh, I well, think. Come that, on, this is a safe space. Uh, there, Let's go. Let's go. There was that what? thing you texted about the other day. Oh, what uh, was it? No, yeah, tell her. I not the guy. What was it? No, remember. Wait, you guys text without me on. No, no. I, you know what? It was, it was a voice note. A voice it was note. a voice note. Uh, it's gone. Okay. It's yes. in the void. You know oh, what? but you were, did, just forgot what you said? Yeah. It was just the other day. It, I, I, you know, oh. I've won too many June shines. Okay, all right. It, on the job. It might have. Did you copy no, that? I'm going to just write that down in my might have been that you were done. a great boss. It, like, okay. you're you're almost, it, you're no, too I perfect. No, but I know. Right, you right, know right, right. I feel right. like I can't, um, I can't be myself around you because, like, I, oh, that's, you're just, like. you're triggered. You're on by a my different level. I'm intimidating. That's exactly what that's it was. bingo. Yeah. I'm intimidating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the It's way. so I should present myself as more flawed to make you feel comfortable. That feels codependent. Like, I, if I'm, you know what I'm saying? I can't, you know what they say, when you get healthy, the sick get angry. Right, that's <laughs> us. We are the sick ones. Yeah, I am enraged. I I know that I my perfect mental health is probably upsetting and intimidating. Mm. I get that, uh, but look at me uh, more of an inspiration, a paragon. Well, if you, will. you know what? Now that you, you know, know, know what that means. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Do you have anything else to say? I'm speechless. I don't think that I really have anything else to ask you. Yeah, these are our, uh, our us problems. Final, final opportunity to tell me things I need to work on about myself in therapy. Anything else? Uh, Grace? I'm scared. I'm, it's a trap. Nothing? I'm terrified. Okay, I mean, look, I'm gonna still go to therapy. I'm still gonna go, because even when you don't think you have anything to work on, there's still something to work on. There's still something there. Yeah. There's still something there. Keep and if digging. You wanna have people in your life give you feedback, but you right. want a real, professional licensed therapist to help you navigate right, those neural, right, right. neural pathways. Sure, right. sure, so sure. they need way more better help than I do at this point yeah. right? because, I mean, being around me. We need best help. It must, you need the best we help. We need the best help. And that help. is at yeah, better help. Right. Well, better help wants you to start living a happier life today. The service is available for clients worldwide and you can start communicating with a licensed therapist. In I don't need it. In under 48 hours. <laughs> I'm, Thank God. I'm done. I'm calling mine right I now. I graduated. <laughs> they were like, you know what? You're good. You don't even need to see you, us anymore. You graduated out of BetterHelp. <laughs> That's great. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And good for you listeners. Get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Whitney. So you know what I'm realizing? It's my job to make you laugh and make you funnier. That's my worth. <laughs> That's my only worth in this world. Um, when did you start? When 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 did you recognize that you were funny? When I moved to LA, I was here for like a year. Oh, uh, really? Yes. Yeah, auditioning. Uh, what was the intention? A dramatic actor or just dramatic act actress? Act well, I had gotten a job uh, on that show, Punked. Uh, with Ashton. Caitlin too, yeah. And yeah, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. I always forget about that because she's just done so, I know her so many and other Dak, I mean, that, that and show Dax, launched a bunch of people's careers. Yes, yeah. Dax was, yeah, the first season and BJ Novak was yeah, actually BJ, on the yeah. first season. Yeah. And so I auditioned for that. I went in to audition to be like a VJ. Like in New York, they asked me to come be a VJ a couple times. When I was in Philadelphia in college, um, I uh, worked uh, at QVC and King of Prussia Mall. I was a, a model for pantyhose and I would walk around and wear, well, that's how I paid for college. And then uh, there was a place called Banyan Productions based in Philadelphia. I know Banyan yeah, they did Extreme yeah, they did. Home Makeover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all those, I was the person that had to be anyone in the auditions because I was like, I'm studying as an actress. So mm -hmm. I would be like the host and then I would be the builder. Then I would be like the person that was coming to see the house and I would be the painting lady or whatever. And I'd have to switch roles and improvise with them. And that uh, an agent saw me do that. 
sent my tape, and then I went in and I was like auditioning for, uh, like to be a VJ. Remember that job? We yeah, were yeah. just like, hey guys, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. And Daisy Fuentes is uh, a gangster, I love her, but it wasn't for me. She's got a very successful line. She's got a, I mean, that's right, I cannot stop talking about Daisy <laughs> Fuentes, it's so wild. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I came in and I was just being, I guess, too ridiculous. And they were like, this isn't for you, but we have this show called Punked that we'd love for you to audition for, which is basically like, you seem like a really good liar and like you have nothing to lose and possibly a psychopath. Mm -hmm. And then I came out and auditioned for that. And I went to that downtown MTV, the one on Colorado. I used to be there, went into audition for an unknown project with Ashton Kutcher. Because, th well, this was the secret season. Remember, he canceled it publicly? Uh -huh. And then there was a secret season. So we didn't really know what we were auditioning for. I showed up. Jason Goldberg, who was his partner at the time, maybe still, who's pretty scary. I mean, he's this tall guy. He's really smart. He comes out. And I looked at the, um, I paid the meter, and I only had a couple quarters. I had like $7 at the time. I did not have any money. And I looked at, and it was like a cattle call. You know, when you would go to auditions, yeah, yeah. and it's just, you know, Osbrink, Omnipop, mm -hmm. Don Buckwald. I didn't mm -hmm. have any. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, I just can't, I can't afford to sit here for, I mean, there's all these models, there's just people everywhere. So I left and Jason saw me leave. He saw me look at it and leave. And he was like, hey, just something about the not giving a shit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or not that psychology of like, I accidentally did a, you know, play hard to get. He was like, come here. And then I went and sat in and we did these improvs and it was him. Ashton was not there. All he wanted me to do was, he was like, I'm going to insult you for as long as I can and let's see how mm -hmm. much you can go. He just was trying to see what you did when you were scared. Mm -hmm. He was just trying to scare yeah. you as much as possible. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I grew up in an alcoholic home with borderline personality family members. Like, the, let's fucking do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there was the one thing I really could do was just keep going back at him and insulting him, insulting him. Mm -hmm. And then, because I was seeing people coming out crying. You know? Yeah. And I was like, oh, uh, yeah. I'm dead inside. Like, we can do this all day. Mm -hmm. And then there was a couple things where he was like, figure out a way in this next improv for me to unbuckle your belt. Looking back with the Me Too stuff, I know why yeah, it yeah. sounds weird, but that's not what he was doing. He was trying to get it so he would take off my belt. Mm -hmm. I had to make a realistic situation where that would be a good solution. Mm -hmm. And so we like did stuff like that. And then I got the job that way. But so, but so then when was the transition where you were like, oh, I... Oh, I, when I was in LA, I would go to like see my friends and I would tell these stories about things that had happened to me or I would just say my opinions about real things and they would laugh. And I was like, this isn't funny, I'm serious. Like mm -hmm. I seriously just got, got towed and I... Blah, blah. And so they would laugh when I was serious. And they're like, you're funny. And I was like, no, I'm a serious person. Well, you mentioned that you're from an alcoholic home, Bo both parents? Uh, addiction... Uh, in both. And did you find that you had to manage a lot of situations? Yeah, I'm yeah. Fi almost 15 years in al -Anon. Yeah, which is adult, uh, or adult child of alcoholics, which is a 12-star program you go to, to, you know, not micromanage, uh, mother, uh, be a... <laughs> Stop letting him interview you. <laughs> Stop letting him interview you. I know, I'm like, I really like this interview. No. But, uh, have you talked about this kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, you, talked, okay, so, I've talked about a bunch. I mean, the main thing is... I just haven't talked to you about I it. Know, cause so, we, uh, I know, because we are... Well, I want to talk to you We're now more. fully just catching maybe up. Maybe it's not here. I would, I would, I would say that uh, my favorite parts of, say, you know, when listening to Howard Stern, for example, or listening to Dax, even, you know, the, you want, I want to hear from the person whose podcast it is, but... That's just me. That is so interesting. But I think also we have not hung out enough. We haven't hung out so enough. So we're like I'm catching up on each other. I'm, I'm one of the things that we're exploring in in Mythic Quest that we're going to continue to explore if we do more seasons, which it looks like we are, um, is why we are who we are. So mm -hmm. and what nature led us, nurture. Yeah. yeah, and what led us to 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 become the human beings that we are, specifically creative people, mm -hmm. and what we what we have the ability to let go of. What should we let go of? Mm -hmm. Because that's a scary thing, I think, for people. In, especially in terms of, of, you know, the essentially like the armor that you built and all the weapons, uh, the emotional weapons and tools that you were able to build for yourself as a child that are no longer necessary, that are now obsolete. You know, I used to walk into rooms like, like I'm gonna embarrass myself before you can embarrass me. I'm gonna, you know, I, I can feel you falling out of love with me. So I'm just gonna, all of the tools that served us really well when we were kids, being unctuous around narcissists, et cetera, et cetera. And which ones are liability and which ones are actually still kind of useful and yeah. which ones are inherited and which ones are socially constructed and or um, passed yeah, and what, what are the things you can hold on to that will allow you to still continue to create what you create mm -hmm. and be the person and the artist that you yep. are, but not destroy yourself in the process? Love it, because I was um, I went to Dr. David Agus for something after he was on the podcast, and he's just this brilliant um, doctor. You guys, like, it's like a famous 
it's on TV all the time talking about COVID, like like fact checking all the Alex Jones stuff. And uh, he, I went down to his office and I did have a th weird bee in my bonnet about people being like, I have anxiety, I have anxiety. And I was like, well, of course you do. You're on a, a ball flying through space that's all, all on fire half the time. And there's like, we should be a little bit anxious. You know, mm -hmm. we, it's, it's only in the last like, whatever, 150 years that we're in buildings with doorman, like, you know, and the world's scary. Anything else would be denial, but obviously people have anxiety disorders, can't get out of their bed. I have, you know, family members like that. So I've, I've seen that, but I went down to his office and I had recently gone on Prozac because I just had this thing where I like that I beat myself up and critique myself. That's how I'm supposed to, I make something good. I'm not going to be like, I love myself and I'm the best. And then go charge people $60 to see something that's hasn't been yeah. <laughs> critiqued yeah. and made better. I, you know, I think that serves me really well. Um, and, uh, I went down to his office and I was like, okay, so I just, I'm having some like anxiety and I just, sometimes like, I just can't focus. Like my brain's here. And then I'm like, I have this idea for this joke. But then I like put down the script. And sometimes if I'm an audition, I'll sort of think I'll want to improvise a joke, but it's a scripted show. Don't improvise. And he was like, is any of this like not working for you? And I was like, oh, I guess it does kind of work. Drives me. Mm -hmm. I guess you're right. He's like, do you want to change that about yourself? Like, mm -hmm. do you want to do worse stand up because you, you know, are so proud and have such high self-esteem about anything you put down. Mm -hmm. So it really made me stop um, over pathologizing stuff like that. Mm. Like this is why I, th this is my magic potion. Like th these are my superpowers. They're not my limitations. Can I ask one more question that I won't ask Please. any more questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, it's not for me. It's for the listeners. <laughs> I think, I think the list, I'm interested in this. I'm going back to the, this is your show, <laughs> but I'm going back to my own instincts. And which your is, show's if I'm interested in it, then I think that the yeah. listener will be interested, unless you've already covered this ad nauseum, not which I don't someone, know. I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts and I feel like you don't. Not with someone like you though, because you and I are, I think pretty similar, but I think the interesting part and I, cause I want to get to Ian and that is that we, we were earlier before we walked in here and uh, you're welcome for not saying save it. Yeah. You know that when you yes. have a podcast, yes. you're like, well, I just... we mostly talked about your house. So there's nothing really to say. <laughs> and uh, um, the toxic work environment that is MQ, I really want to deconstruct okay. because I do believe everyone's superpowers in that office are probably things that most people would go like, I need to get that. I need to change that about myself. And but a lot of the things that make things toxic toxic quote unquote because we also have such a um low bar f now for what is toxic and what is hard and what is uncomfortable you know i think it's important that people are able to be uncomfortable in situations and if you don't like your boss no one likes their boss i don't know what to tell you yeah. and someone that has a superpower you know as comedians i remember eric zicklin said this once uh, when I was doing a TV show that I was running at a very young age and I kind of didn't realize it's just a lot of like math and sitting in meetings and knowing like how to add numbers in your head super fast. And you know, I was just kind of sitting there acting mm -hmm. like a showrunner is mm -hmm. really what I was doing. Yeah. And um, just like nodding and being like, yeah, it should, it should probably be the blue couch. Cause what if it looks weird on camera? Like I would just say things that I thought showrunner said. Sure. And um, Eric Zicklin said this once he was like, cause he's been on so he was on Frasier. He's been on so many shows uh, with comedians that got their own show. And he's like, it's basically like network saying you're really creative and hilarious. Now come run a seven 11. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have a skill set for that, which yeah. is part of the reason you can be so creative. You can be so creative because you don't follow rules and you're not thinking about people's feelings all the time, even though you have really big feelings and you have to focus on the big picture. You have to keep people moving. You have to have such a passion. But now that's interpreted to some people as like toxic. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if this person isn't a little bit erratic or different and not constantly thinking about your feelings, like this thing's not going to get made. Yeah. When do we pr when do we allow and when do we go? Aside racism, sexism, sexual, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just general disagreeing with people in a workplace now feels like an yeah, attack. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the, I, the, these are the exact things that we're talking about all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, and, and things uh, are constantly evolving and changing. But I think I think what it what it really comes back to all the time is the thing is something you mentioned earlier, which is like, you know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we, we, we discuss this all the time. Um, Meg can come in mm -hmm. and she can be wearing a, a, a really cute top, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, Meg, you look cute today, right? And I'm very cognizant of when I would say that, how I would say that, if I would say that, yeah. what our relationship is. Yeah. I've, I've known her for 10 years. I, we've been friends. Like, and there's a context and there's also just simply a way that it's being presented. Mm -hmm someone else could come in, say the same exact thing, and she could be 100% totally creeped out about that, mm -hmm. right? And then 
the argument of the third party moron would say, well, there's a double standard, right? Why does somebody get to do this one thing and this other guy doesn't get to do this other thing? And it's literally the same thing. Yep. And you're basically relying on some sort of sixth sense or a lizard brain thing mm -hmm. or whatever it is, but we're human beings and that's a part of what it is. It's not math, that we have to trust our instincts mm -hmm. and that, like you said, you've navigated a good portion of your life recognizing that like, oh, this situation is creeping me out. This mm -hmm. guy's a creep mm -hmm. and I know I need to get away from him. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of things that are like dicey. I'm obsessed with that shit. I'm yes. obsessed with it. The yes. book, The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker, uh -huh. yeah. is um, which every every man should read it too about how to trust your gut as a woman mm -hmm. because the number, and I, I know I talk about this a lot, you guys, but I think you would love this. Um, whenever women are sexually assaulted, abused, attacked, 99% uh, of them in the interview afterwards with the police. The other 1%, they is, w didn't say they didn't do this. They were just too traumatized or unkind. They couldn't interview them. They were just mm -hmm. too upset. And uh, they always say, I knew there was something off about that guy. Mm -hmm. I just, I knew it. He did all the right things. He carried my groceries. He called me ma'am. He offered to hold the door, but I just, I knew mm -hmm. something was off. And that's always my stuff with security is whenever uh, uh, like a, a big dude or like a Howard Stern fan is like, Baba Booey and like comes up to me and tries to touch me and security will try. I'm like, no, no. I, I promise this, you, this, yeah, yeah. this guy's okay. Yeah. I'm worried about that guy in the corner that's mm -hmm. not trying to get my attention with just something about, I don't know, he, well, that skinny guy, I'm telling you, that's the one. And yeah. I can't even explain why, you just have to trust me. Yeah, yeah, and so th so that's exactly what we're, what we're talking about uh, in, in the show, which is um, we have to try to continually find whatever those lines are of what is acceptable and what's unacceptable, mm -hmm. both in a workplace environment and just in a, in a social <laughs> environment, right? And it's just gonna keep evolving and keep changing and then certain things will resonate with the culture and we'll say, oh yeah, that's fucked up. I can't believe that was ever a, like a possibility. Yeah, it's like when, um, when I, I remember the, when this, all the Me Too stuff was hitting Hollywood and all the male agents were like, oh, so we can't even hug a woman at work anymore? And it was like, you, you never could. Yeah. Like that's a, that was never a <laughs> something yeah. that was appropriate. Like yeah. your assistant, don't hug her. Totally. And and I I get that argument quite a bit with people thinking that I'm going to commiserate with them, which is like, oh man, we can't even like make jokes about this or whatever anymore. And I'm like, well, no. But but also like the, there's no. I truly believe there's not an attack on comedy. I, I I just don't think there is. I, I think what it's forcing people to do is to uh, dig a little bit deeper yep. and maybe get a little bit more specific yep. and maybe, Level up, be yeah. more thoughtful about well, it, be more thing. artful about it. That's all. It's just simply- This is a gift to comedians. It's weeding out the hacks. I keep going in his coverage with no, my- you, you might keep drifting off to the- like, Dare you, more. why? That's weird. Because you're un unconsciously grabbing it. And kind Always of, uh, white men, constantly that. mansplaining. Unbelievable. Yeah. Really quick on mansplaining. Remember I was trying to write that bit about mansplaining where I was like, please mansplain to me. You have all the information. Who's gonna tell me otherwise? But then someone's like, mansplaining is more if you already know something and a guy explains it to you. Yes. But I don't, I, I just, I, I, I was like, let's not be so proud that we don't get the information from sure. the men on how to do the thing ourselves. Cause they, they know how to do it, we don't. Okay, so that's a good example of something that I'm, I have to learn how to navigate, right? Because I've been in a position of power for a long time running these TV shows. Mm -hmm. And yet I have people who work for me, uh, younger people, both mm -hmm. men and women, mm -hmm. who, uh, who are coming up through the ranks. Mm -hmm. And I have to be very respectful of the fact that sometimes they either want to hear my opinion of how I would navigate a situation, mm -hmm. and sometimes they don't. And but the, the, the easiest way to know is whether or not they fucking ask. So if you're not asking me, yep, yep, yep. then I'm not gonna have to offer the information. And if but they some, wanna know, they'll ask. This generation does not lack 100%. confidence. 100%, or if I get a sense that someone is a little bit reticent to ask for whatever reason it might be, I might, I might pick a time where I can find them and say, hey, I just noticed you were interested in this. Is there anything you wanna discuss or anything no. you wanna talk about, th uh, about this? Maybe I can, nice. I can. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. <laughs> I didn't say remember you did Remember when I sat down? At what point did I say you didn't do Remember when we were sitting down uh, and uh, what were we talking about? Wh how, what shows make money and why? Remember I was like giving that speech? And it was so funny because Benton, with, like younger generation sees things in such a different way. And I was like, no, 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 the, like the syndication thing, that, that shit might have sailed, but this is what happens. You get points, you never give up your points, you get an EP credit, but you don't make you know, as much. And we were talking about movies and you don't make as much for movies, but if big movie stars, they make a lot of their money on like mm -hmm. the campaigns you get otherwise. So when people want to go like, women in Hollywood don't make as much, agree of course but also 
they get to make a ton of money from Lancome and Chanel and all these other things that guys can't do. I mean, you can, George Clooney can do his watch ads in China or whatever, but it's like, there's other ways to make money as women. Just having a, having the gross conversation, like having the discomfort and the uncomfortable conversation. But I believe you can have those uncomfortable conversations, but it, it depends on how things are framed. Again, yeah. like in a writer's room, it's a, it's, it's considered a safe space to have mm -hmm. difficult conversations. Yeah. That still doesn't mean that anybody can walk in and just be a few, uh, uh, abusive of or make a like a straight up racist joke and say, well, no, I'm in a writer's room, therefore I'm protected. No, 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 no. Um, so, Those days are over. However, there is a way to frame, as in everything in life, frame a conversation by saying, okay, I recognize that this is dicey. Mm -hmm. I have a question about it and mm -hmm. I want, do I have your permission to to allow for maybe something that might come across as racist because I sit or misogynistic or homophobic or whatever it might be because I truly have a blind spot and I want to understand yes. Because I yes, I want to become a better person, but also because it actually makes the work better yeah. and makes the show more interesting because it's layered with another person's point of view. <laughs> you can frame things that way, and what you find is that human beings rise to the occasion. They recognize what you, it is that you're trying to do, and then we're all working in communion with one another to make whatever decision we are we, we make to, to progress the story. But I'm also not asking some random person on the street to get their emotional labor. I'm not like, hey, you're black. Can you explain something to me and give me your, your time? I mean, you totally. are getting paid. Like, it's I hired you because I want your brain. I want your point of view. Yes. I want to learn from you also, you know, and we want your voice in the show. So if I, I kind of like feel weird about walking on eggshells about asking someone something if that's their job too. Right, you know? and so so one like, thing- Like, why am I asking you to do your job right now? And why am, do I, am I worried about getting in trouble? Totally, but I think that people, I, okay, so I'll give you an example. So one thing that we, th this this interesting line that we have to navigate, or at least I have to navigate, is, you know, you hire, okay, on Mythic Quest, we have a young, gay, black woman who grew up in LA, yes. right? Now, I can write funny shit, and I can write interesting storylines, and I know the things that um, connect us all as human beings, however, I can't get specific mm -hmm. enough to create a really well-rounded character, right? right? So the only person that, truly can mm -hmm. is a young Sinbad. gay <laughs> well if he was available he's but he's he's funny i've had Sinbad on su on sunday i agree he's, legit. he's hilarious he if you need to know anything about windbreakers he's the guy <laughs> Oh, that's right, that's right. <laughs> uh, but so so you, you, we went out looking and we found a young gay black woman who grew up in LA, right? Nice. So then you have her in the room, but then I was- and She wasn't even a writer, I just found her in a coffee shop. She, she uh, I love hiring non-writers too, by the way. She wasn't a writer, actually. She was a teacher in my kid's school. Amazing. Well, she, she was a writer, but that's a whole different story. She was, she had a graduate degree, but was teaching and then her, the, the degree was in comedy writing. It was, it was quite fortuitous. Yeah. Anyway, the point is then, then she's in the room and I have to make sure, and I had a very honest conversation with her, which was, look, I brought you in to, to, be, to deliver this particular point of view, but not only because of that, right? Because mm -hmm. I need someone who's funny and someone I want to spend time with and somebody who I think can progress all elements of the story and the human condition further. But yes, I have to be honest that I'm also bringing you in for this specific reason. It would be like saying, hey, I'm bringing Meg in to write for the women. So what I do is I write for the men and mm -hmm. she writes for the women. What the fuck is That's that? Silly. Right, it's silly. However, there is some truth to the fact that I'm also bringing in Meg to write for the women That's because right. I can't deliver that point of view. Again, And it's not just dialogue, it's also how the situation exactly. would go down. Exactly. So third party moron looks at that and goes, well, that's a double standard. What you're saying is you are bringing her into Bright for Women, but also not. And I'm like, well, you're a fucking moron. Who are you talking, who are these people you're talking I'm, about? The QAnon no, it's, awards? Yeah, it's when you hear, yeah. when you hear criticism of, of whatever. Will but I don't think anybody that, that doesn't make television should weigh in. That's my whole thing. It's sure. like, you just shouldn't, you don't know, you're, you're not here. You don't know how it works. You don't understand, like, to me, I always, I, I had this theory when um, I got like trashed a lot me, making television and, and especially multicam, because I made a multicam at a time that no one was making multicam. And all the reviews were like, uh, this is canned laughter. And it was like, what? Like, what? come to a show. Yeah. Come to a show and watch how it works. And then I discovered that the mics uh, were under the seats, which was not ideal, so it was louder. I also then learned uh, you should mix up the jokes every time for uh, a multicam audience because as soon as they know the punchline, they're going to start laughing like a little too soon. Uh, they're going to laugh as if they've heard the joke before. Uh, you always want to get, so I would always do the joke I wanted to put in the show last as like a surprise. And 
But the reviewers and the critics, they wouldn't. I was like, why don't you come see how we make this? Why don't you go see the people in the audience? Like, you know, if you haven't made a show or made television or taken a risk like this, or even like what you did with your $300 making a pilot stand up, same thing. I'm like, everyone just go, go do stand up just, just to see the level of difficulty when you want to weigh in and say, oh, I didn't like that and here's why. Well, what I find interesting is that there's so many people who write about television uh, for a living who don't understand the process of writing for television. At all. And so, and I think, look, that's fine. Everybody has a, a, a job and a niche and a thing that they go to do. No, but you're just trolls. You know, it's like the, is it the Oscar Wilde quote? I feel like he said most of the quotes, right? That um, critics are the people that go where the battle was fought and they shoot, uh, and they shoot the survivors. Well, <laughs> I I happen I happen to, to to think that there is a room for criticism, like outside third party criticism, mm -hmm. because I think it's I think it's interesting to hear. It's certainly not an objective point of view; it's a subjective point of view. But it's mm -hmm. somebody who's not on the inside, and then can have at least uh, a learned opinion about about something. Yeah, but something, you're right? you have a childhood. You're triggered. You don't like this kind of thing. Totally. You're, you're, was, this is all your emotions. But that's a part of their job if they're a good critic. Every female critic. I mean, this was you know, 10 years ago when there weren't a lot of female critics and there weren't a lot of females on TV creating their own shows that were like trying to say that, that the NBC show I did was sexist. It was like, okay, well, my showrunner's a woman. This is a gender reversal where the man is doing the tra uh, traditionally female behavior. The females are like, did you watch it? Or, oh, you just don't like me. Yeah. And that's totally fine. Yeah. But this felt like a DM. Sure. This didn't feel like a review. <laughs> well, sure. Get the voodoo doll of me and just poke of it instead well, that, of... Then, then, of course, there's the question of who are these people and what mm -hmm. are their credentials. But I can tell you that there are a number of, of critics whose work I really respect and I read and I go, oh, that's interesting. I never mm. thought about it that way. But they're really good Elvis at Elvis Mitchell job. always did that. Yeah, Emily Nussbaum is like, to me, like just somebody who I seek out, not, not to, to see whether or not I want to um, watch a show or not, because I think mm -hmm. that's bullshit. But when I love a show or I hate a show, and she's done a, a, a piece about it's it, it's like asking your like coolest friend, like, did you like that? Should yes. I should I give it a go? Or like, she can get you to think about it in a way that you hadn't thought about it before, which uh, to me is like the best kind of like criticism. Uh, that that said, um, if I can't believe how few people um, know that a person's name being like, oh, this is written by, mm -hmm. right? Then they think, oh, well, the entire episode was written by that one person. Mm -hmm. And then whether it's um, demonization or accolades that go to that one person, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's completely false. It doesn't, that doesn't represent what the writer's room is. The writer's room is truly a communion and confluence of so many different people and sure. then all put through the grinder of the executive producer. But it's also like, I remember watching, um, uh, what was the one with Idris Elba where he was, uh, um, Help! Can you look up uh, Idris Elba, the, that Netflix movie he did when he played the dictator? Doesn't matter. But he, they were shooting a scene where someone was like probably 50 yards away with these giant like like hay bailey things. How am I not married? Um, and I was watching. I was like. No one understands how hard this scene is to shoot. No one. There's an AD that's lying down in the field looking up. This is an audio nightmare. This person is mic. The, the grass is hitting the mic. No one can hear each other. Someone's like, did you get it? Like, the actor has no idea what the, the uh, coverage is. And I was like, no one is going to get how hard this scene is to shoot. Mm -hmm. This scene alone should get an Oscar. So mm -hmm. it's like, to me, it's this, the sound editor on that, like, should get paid a million dollars a minute. I mean, it's the kind of thing where it's like, but, but people just go, okay, scene in the field. It's like golf. Yeah. Golf is the hardest thing to shoot, but no one's watching golf being like, wow, these DPs are incredible. Uh -huh. It's like that guy's hitting the ball, but he's following the ball, which yeah. is incredibly hard to do. So to me, I'm like, I will never critique a DP that shoots golf because I think they're, I know how hard that is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I truly, I, I never, I have very strong opinions on lots of TV Beast of No Nation, movies, I just thought of it. Oh. That's the name of the movie, Beast of No Nation. Is the um, tester that came in to replace uh, the girl when she became the streamer based on this person? Oh, no. Okay. Um, it's based on his, a version of his actual personality. Interesting. He's not really. But like I got it. it. I did kind of get it. Yeah. No. Well, he, well, I'll tell you this. He represents, uh, you're, the character you're talking about, his name is Lou. Yes. As played by Craig Mazin. Yes. Um, Craig is a writer, and I've known him for years. And he is mostly, well, he's, he's worked in comedy, but he's most famous for Chernobyl. He wrote Chernobyl. And 
He, um, wow. and so he's a big video game guy. He's a friend of mine. He worked a little bit on Mythic Quest. And so uh, we, we, we wanted like a character that could represent like a middle-aged or even like older than middle-aged white dude who had like been in this job forever. He's every, just, like, so every guy in every writer's room when I first started, it is ha like harrowing. To, I mean, how exact it is. And I think any waitress or any you know woman, uh, male, dom everyone sees this everywhere. Is my guess, but it was just I think everyone will see that character and has that person in their life. Yeah. So and work. the great thing about Craig is that he's so, he's truly like such a wonderful person that he knows that because he's so fucking smart, like he could be that person and he do and he isn't, and yet he does tend to. Um, hate everybody and everything, which is something I love about him. And he's such a curmudgeon, but he's such a like teddy bear in real life. Like he doesn't actually act on those impulses, yeah. but I think he wants to. So I think this was like a big release for him. And but he represents like he definitely represents the guy that you wrote. Yes, down on that yes, yes. Of. And then with the the you know working overtime, working long, and all that kind of stuff, I kind of was like, okay, I think I have an idea of this um, the specificity of this show. Again, and we always say the more um, specific you are, the more universal you are. The fact that I relate to all this so specifically it means everybody else will it's like that's that guy in my job that's the guy in my job it's about what it is about a writer's room I yeah mean, the show the show is about a video game but the reason I wanted to do the show in the first place what I didn't want to do a show about video games I went and visited a company and when I walked in and they explained to me how it all worked I was like this sounds like a television show yeah like the way that they the way that they produce it and so I just know that world and so I think it's triggering for a lot of people who work in the entertainment industry. What what have you learned about human nature or yourself or um, you know just our mental evolution now that you've been working in video games? I'm always very curious if if video games went away tomorrow, would we all just be would there be carnage in the street? Would we would the people that play video games or or would that catharsis go away and would we just be savages? Would crime be rampant? I, I don't know. I, however, I can say that it's not a world that I knew very much about prior to doing the research for the show. And I can say, and I think, I think historically, it's just been a, like a community that's been marginalized in popular culture to be these just like dorks who live in their basement or whatever. But it is a global phenomenon. Yep. Billions of people play games. And I think what's so, and yes, is there a dark side to it? I don't mean 100%. that. I just mean, you know, there's this thing, um, Calcio Storico, which is this, uh, uh, you would love it. It's um, basically, uh, it's football but MMA fighting and in Italy, yeah, Florence, seen, yeah, they do yeah, once you, documentary that documentary about it. Yeah. So the, the week in Florence that they do that, crime goes down to about zero. Mm -hmm. I'm just always obsessed with what are the things we do to get stuff mm -hmm. out of our system, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. our video games are part of that. Yeah, I, I, th I think so. And I'll go one step further, which is like, again, I tried, I tried there, there are so many negative aspects to, to gaming and, and they're well documented and well talked about to, to me. Uh, what I see that's um, most um, heartwarming and optimistic is the community that's based yeah. around it and the connections that are made uh, by people who have historically been looking for that sense of community and haven't found it in the traditional mm -hmm. ways that we did growing up. Um, and, you know, maybe if you weren't a very good baseball player or couldn't do the, you know, you didn't feel comfortable being on the debate team, whatever yeah. it is, you had to find other outlets, but those outlets were very isolating. Yeah. Whereas now with online gaming, community. there's a community that, and you can become not only friends with people all over the globe, but you can you can do the thing that's most important in life, I think, which is to feel connected to other human beings. And that didn't exist before, and now it does. And I, I think there's something really great about it. I'm that. fascinated about video games because there's a bunch of studies that I have them here that um, kids that play, because there's this thing of video games are bad for kids. Like, there are studies that say that kids that play video games actually have faster reflexes mm -hmm. in the world. It's just, it feels like such an interesting thing that we grapple with so much. And I'm so, and I'm so curious because, you know, think about, I would, I would, why would anyone want to spend all their time in the real world if they could go into some magical world? You know, yeah. it just sort of, there's something, it just says more about how shitty reality is, is that everyone wants to escape it all the time. Well, and what you can do, what you're seeing with a lot of those online communities too, is that they're able to create a world of their own. So mm -hmm. yes, they're playing fill in the blank game, whatever the fucking game is. Yes, and that's a part of the experience, but they're also communicating with one another. Mm -hmm. And the way that they're communicating is a, a sense of is also a, a kind of world building. Yeah. Because they're now they're now building whatever experience they want the mm -hmm. world to be, mm -hmm. which is really empowering, empowering especially yeah. for kids who all day long are being told what the fuck to what to do. Now they get a, a, a mode of control. Yeah. Which I mean, it, it, but 
just like anything else, I had to take the iPads away from my kids. And, and, and it has actually um, been wonderful since the iPads have been gone. Interesting. Because what I noticed was they were just like, it's just like anything else. You do too much of it and, mm-hmm. you, and, you, and you abuse it and right. you go in the wrong direction with it or you go to the extreme, it's going to have uh, negative consequences. And that's what happened with iPad games. Right. And they're 10 and 9. Maybe when they're 15 and 16. Well, they say okay. it's very close to, in the brain, like a gambling addiction because mm-hmm. you're always playing for that last win. So I would try to play Fruit Ninja. I'd be like, I'm going to play it a couple times. But then it was like, well, now I have to beat my score. Then I got lower and I have to prove this to myself. And then it stops being a choice. Yes. So that's when it's an addiction, when it stops being a choice and starts to feel like work. Almost like the laughs. Almost. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just pointing that out. I mean, I, yes, I, but I, feel, me. I feel the same way, which is like, what is, the, it's a level of validation it, that I'm seeking, it's, I don't do it the same way that you do up on stage, but like, I want people to like what I do. I want people to have a reaction to it. Certainly if I'm, my intention is to make people laugh, I want them to laugh. If, I, if my intention is to make them cry, I want them to cry. And if I don't get that, um, does, it, does it chip away a little bit at my soul? And then mm-hmm. what the fuck does that mean? And if so, why? And why do so I need why? it so bad? Why do I need it so bad? I mean, that's really what I'm always experimenting with on stage was how long can I go without making a joke? Mm-hmm. And how long can I hold a joke for the maximum? And, you know, if I know I have a good one, I'll wait, 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 wait for the laugh, wait for the claps to go down, the laughs and see if I can just buy a little more time. It's like a funny little game to like, see how, um, uh, okay with myself I can be without a laugh for how long because some great things come out of that, those silences too. But your profession is to me the scariest. You put yourself in a place that no other human being really does especially or certainly in our in, in our business which is I get to I get to work and write and then I control every aspect of the thing and then eventually when everything's perfect in my mind, mm-hmm. I put it out and then it still might get destroyed. No, I want to do that too. There's just been a couple of times where they say they like, you know, wanted to, I mean, I've definitely tried to do that. You do it so well. You know, I, I, I've done you that. You did it incredibly successfully. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank did you. Did you not? Thank you. I don't, I, I mean, I have had a couple of pilots that have not gone since and it was always like, this is too weird. This is too like meta. It's too... You know, like I was having. But you co- but, but wait a second. Wait. The you, last you, two pilots that I did, one didn't go because it was just uh, for a litany of reasons. The Lisa Kudrow, Martin Short, Greg Kinnear thing I, I did for Amazon, and then uh, this other thing I did for HBO didn't happen because it was just too weird. It was like I was having like fantasies where Jenna Jameson was my like like life coach. They just were like, this is a lot. But Can- so you're taking your last two, your last two projects, last two pilots, which are like historically the I mean the hardest things to do in television. And using that as an indicator of your success in running television series? Well, I mean, it's you keep going. You've I've done two. Yes, but to do one that goes 14 is bigger than doing, in my opinion, five that have gone yeah, four. Yeah, but you got you could have you could have stayed on broke two broke girls for mm-hmm. as long as you wanted, and mm-hmm. that could have gone forever. And then you could have stayed on Roseanne. Right? Could I have? I don't know. Could I have? I don't really know. Yeah, sure. I don't know the specifics. It darted my neck. But I know that it that you launched, you launched the return of one of the greatest shows of all time to mass, like mass appeal and also mass critical success. Like that's impossible. And all the showrunners in Hollywood, you were really supportive. Thanks so much for being so cool during that time. When I watched it, it was one of the most progressive shows mm-hmm. on television that have, had ever been made. DJ mm-hmm. doesn't ki- kick, I'm sorry, DJ doesn't kiss the black girl in the school play. Then she goes to talk to the dad or the dad comes to talk to her, remember? And she locks the yeah. door of the diner. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was yeah. like, that was, I mean, I think you're like this too in terms of having the bravery to play a character who is a narcissist, who is ignorant, who has a blind spot, you know, and she was willing to play someone that did something racist Mm -hmm. and ignorant, you Mm -hmm. know? Like, we need people to go that far and be that brave. If you have someone's brain that's that brave, it's gonna show up in other ways too. You Mm -hmm. can't decide you can only be brave in one way and then you have to turn the thing off when you go home, you know? So, um, she, uh, I don't know, everyone just Twitter, the self-righteous indignation of she's the reason Trump won, or like, it, it. she always said, the reason that I, that Roseanne was my favorite show is she would always say that just because you're poor doesn't mean you're stupid. Mm -hmm. And in Hollywood, that's the thing. I mean, is Joe Blow and Iowa going to get that joke? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Is the guys, are the people in Virginia get that? Yeah, I have family in Virginia. They're smarter than you. Yeah. You're just pitching old, you know, Veronica's Closet episodes. Yeah. This is going to probably be made with or without me. I mean, it was. I mean, Tom Warner, I'm sure you know Tom, was you know going to do it. Sarah, Sarah Gilbert was already involved. Um, John Goodman already say, said he was down. If, if John Goodman's doing anything, I will do 
craft services. So, um, and then Lori Metcalf, and I'm like, okay, great. So she did, what an amazing opportunity yeah. to reach uh, everyone. You know, Jackie voted for Hillary. She ended up panicking and voting for Jill Stein and vo voted for Trump. Like, let's have these conversations because yeah. I'm seeing all these families get torn apart because they voted differently. Let's watch that. You know, let's have, uh, um, you know, Sarah's son want to wear a dress to school in Elgin, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And the conflict so fast, instead of just going like, you can do whatever you want, we're so woke, being didactic to people saying, this is what you should do in this situation. If you're, it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. This is a man who's 65 years old, who he, he's basically saying, you can wear whatever you want in the house. I, don't, I don't, do not care, but I know how kids treat a child that looks different. I used to beat up the um, foreign exchange students. Am I an irresponsible person for letting you go to school and address mm -hmm. knowing you're gonna get your ass kicked? I can't let you get your ass kicked. You know, so that was such a fascinating thing that no one had the audacity to t let a character think that way. But I feel like right now you're defending something that was universally accepted as awesome. Oh yes, no, it's Wasn't just more it? that I went on, I, I did like a show. Like didn't everybody love that? I will answer more of your questions about that later because <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm like, not being funny and uh, trying to not be boring. But because I was, don't, do you think people would find this boring? There was also so much, so much, I mean. I, I find this fascinating. Gun. I didn't even know that that was the case. I, from, I, I'm, I'm obviously not an outsider, but it right. seemed like from my point of view, it was like that went over like gangbusters. Like everybody in the industry was yeah. excited. Everybody in the audience was excited. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry that you. Yeah, no, it's, it was just, it was pretty, um, it was just pretty wild, I guess, just at the end of the day. And it was, um, and look, she did say some crazy shit, but that's what we should put on TV. My, I said to one of the showrunners, I was like, so you just think people that voted for Trump shouldn't be allowed to be represented on television? I think part of the reason they voted that way is because they didn't feel seen and they felt yeah. underrepresented. Like, why, yeah. like, like all you Harvard dorks, like, I don't know how to tell you that, <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not a Harvard, I'm not from, I didn't go to Harvard. Like, I don't just want to do Simpsons, you know, super clever jokes that only half the audience. Guys, like I think that show is brilliant, but you know, so I guess it was just um, and Lori Metcalf and John Goodman. Don't you just want to watch this show again? I got their big struggle. Speaking of having young people on a production uh, and then older people, so uh, John Goodman's character Dan obviously uh, works as a construction worker, and there's illegal, undocumented workers taking his jobs. That is a very real thing that would happen to Dan in that moment. So we were like, opioid addicts, that would absolutely be happening because they can't afford to get the surgery done, so they just have to stop the bleeding. Dan would be losing stuff to uh, undocumented workers, blah, blah, blah. DJ would be, have gone to the military. That's how it would have gone. And there was this scene where Dan was telling Roseanne that an undocumented worker took her, his work. And he said, uh, illegals. These illegals are taking the jobs. In his private kitchen with his mm -hmm. wife mm -hmm. at 65, that's what he would have said. Mm -hmm. He would have said illegals, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And then we go through the rehearsal, it all works, and then a lot of the younger people are like, humans can't be illegal. We're like, yeah, we know, he doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. He doesn't read, you know, um, all the stuff that we read. He doesn't watch the shows that we watch, like he doesn't know any of this. He's not in Hollywood, and they're like, well, he can't say that. And it was like, well, he ha that's what he would say. Mm -hmm. That's the only mm -hmm. uh, word he would really know to describe the situation. Yes. So it was, a, it was a really big saga, and I was in HR a lot, but you have to fight, like, that's the kind of thing I would fight through. Yeah. You know, I, I don't need to fight for a joke in the writer's room that's never gonna get it in, but I will fight for the character staying the character. And not, you know what I mean, especially yes. older characters. That's what they would call it. He would say secretary. Yes. That, he wouldn't say chief of staff. He'd say secretary. Yes. Stuff like that. Well, and then it just becomes a question of what, what are you, then the platform becomes what are you celebrating or what are you not celebrating? So yeah. for example, in that, in that situation, you're being authentic without celebrating necessarily what the behavior is that got him. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You're just presenting a real human being. Yeah. I, I, I'm, it's Willie Loman. I mean, if you yeah. go back and watch, you know, it's like it, he wouldn't have access to this. That means he's like on Vulture every day, like trying to see who got canceled for saying the wrong word. He's just not. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. It was it was pretty wild, but it is. Um, I would consider it from uh, uh, from an outsider's point of view that was incredibly successful. Oh my gosh! Thanks. Well, let's talk about more of your success because I know I have to let you out. I feel like I'm using uh, taking advantage of you. Oh my god! Don't look at your watch, please. I was just curious. Um, can you spill I, your water on have, your watch so it's not working? I, I want to talk about. This. I want to talk. To you, I want to talk to you off the air and on the air. Uh, this isn't even the air. The psychology of men who wear rings. Yes. I want to get into it. Great, let's get into it. 
such a brilliant, brilliant, th I mean, as soon as you see that, you know, yeah, you know I know okay. exactly who I'm dealing with. Yeah. I know exactly who I'm dealing with. But it, to me, is always such a shame that men don't get to wear jewelry. <laughs> like, I'm so bummed for them. You know, there's so few things you guys can do. Like, you, you can wear a watch and that's pretty much it. Chain wallet, maybe. But there's something fascinating to me, like, about wearing rings, because historically it must have been about showing wealth, right? It was for royals to show off how much money they had, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, yeah. It's used, like, when, what happens to Ian when he's putting his rings on, and mm -hmm. what do they mean to him? Um, yeah, so it, it was based on when I, when I was um, doing research on what, who these guys are, because it's all guys. Um, uh, that's changing to a certain extent, but the kind of people that are creative directors mm -hmm. and like to uh, who ascend to those positions, um, they there's like a very specific look. Mm -hmm. It's really strange. And <laughs> what I, the, the thing that I was getting the a Jack lot, Dorsey's and the yeah, I was getting a lot on Twitter uh, where people saying like, "Oh, that's me." Like, I mean, I'm telling you, there's like 15 to 20 guys who are like, "Oh, they're talking about me." Like he's doing like a version of me, That's and then I would like scroll through their photos. I'm like, I guess I am. And but you're I confirmed didn't... narcissist. Yes, Confirmation. But I never. I. And it doesn't surprise me that these people are narcissists because, and at one point, um, Ian's talking about how he builds worlds that mm -hmm. millions of people across the world play in. He's right. And that's what a narcissist, he's right. Yeah. Um, uh, and also narcissists believe that everything is, is, is an extension of them. Yes, yes. And so th this is something that we're talking about constantly, which is, is Ian a narcissist uh, or is he, is, he, is he narcissist adjacent? That he, because my concern from the beginning was like, I did this other show where the, the characters never learn, they never grow, mm -hmm. they never have the capacity to grow or change because that would fuck the show up. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna do that again. I wanna do a show where maybe we can see that someone, that uh, we can see someone grow and change mm -hmm. and that, that it's messy and difficult and you take two steps forward and one step back. But if you try, you can melt yes. some of the shit. And the problem with narcissism, um, true narcissism is that it's, it's, it's like sociopathy to a certain extent. Lack where of you, empathy a Yeah, bit. there is no ability to change that mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. They're born like that and they're gonna die like that, unfortunately. Right. So uh, we wanted to make sure that maybe he was exhibiting signs of it, but maybe isn't, wouldn't be uh, necessarily like, um, because uh, there are, I know, don't, 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 come for me in the comments. See in the comments on this one, but there are versions of Asperger's that do, people can conflate with a narcissist because you're just not reading other people's faces. You're not reading that they're not like smiling and like mm -hmm. your ideas necessarily. Um, but narcissists fascinate me because number one, narcissists, no, a, a narcissist can't acknowledge that they're a narcissist. Any kind of self-criticism would shatter them. Yeah. So is, if someone says, I think I'm a narcissist, that means they're not a narcissist. I remember going to my therapist being like, am I a narcissist? Just because I was just like, you know, insecure and and thinking, and I'm like, I'm doing my stand up, but I'm standing alone. I'm like, am I a She's like, narcissists don't drive to therapists and right. ask if they think they're perfect. You're self involved. What's that? Yeah, You're it's absorbed. Self -involved, self -absorbed. Absorbed, sure. you see. And I think, as I think a lot of people who do what we do are. Um, and I think to a certain extent you kind of have to be yeah. because you're, you're putting yourself out there and saying what I have to say is important and you should all listen to mm -hmm. me. And then we like, wait for what, they, <laughs> what their response is. And then if you do respond at all, a security person removes sure, you from the sure. show and you st I get to keep your money anyway. Yes. And so and and <laughs> so we wanted to kind of build a character like that for him which is like that that he's close but he's also asking the questions cuz we do we do slowly start to change him. He does allow for like uh, the little crack in his armor to start to splinter. And I think that's what we're taking in the second season. You know what's interesting that I was um, uh, reading about narcissists once is that narcissists, all of their narcissism is very specific to what would have pleased their dads or primary caretakers. Mm -hmm. So that there's certain people that are narcissistic in some areas, but not others, because that's not what their dad cared about. So if guys, it's like, I want you to be good at sports, I want you to be good at fighting. But a narcissist that wants to be good at fighting and sports, they're not gonna go to a flower shop, be like, I made the best flower arrangement, because their dad didn't care about that. Yeah. They'll be like, I suck at this. I gotta go back to the thing I'm great at, because I'm the best at it, and you yeah. need me. Yeah. So there's something interesting about him like not needing to be the best at something else. Because yeah, not, not giving a shit about something. Yeah, and being like, oh, I'm not, not good at this. And everyone's yeah. like, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's kind of fascinating to me. Well, I, I, I also, again, because we do this other show that, that nobody learns or grows, like I am interested, because of all the things that you were talking about, that I do think that, the da that we are in a somewhat dangerous place, not because I, like I don't, I don't actually believe in cancel culture, I don't think it's happening. Okay. How, however, Mel Gibson I, has 13 movies in production. Yeah, I, I, I do think that there, are, there, is, there is a tendency um, out of, out of self-preservation 
uh, to deem things either wholly good or wholly bad, like bl black, white, good, evil, Served us very well uh, for the thousands of years that we did not have yes. streetlights. It's like, this person's bad, just run. Just make the generalization and just run. Right, and so I totally understand it, and, but, and yet I'll, I'll say that there was, we've gotten incredibly, um, the, the show's really well received, which is awesome, but every once in a while we'll- I can't believe you didn't know about your Emmys. Did nobody tell you? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, the other show, the other show, like, is like I'm so programmed to not like really actually actually give a shit about Think that. Think about stuff. all that. Um, but the um, the the I don't know what was I just. I derailed about? you. I'm yeah. sorry. What was about I narcissism? No. About uh, Benton. Generalizations for safety and. Yes, that was, we are programmed to make things yes. black and white. Okay, so then some of the criticism that um, that uh, that I've seen. Um, and I don't put any stock into it, but it, it makes me nervous about the way that people are sort of approaching s some of the popular culture is, I don't like this show because I don't know if they're saying Ayn is good or bad. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, that's really dangerous. That's someone who needs uh, a decision that can't um, tolerate gray. Yes, yes, and I can understand it if you're saying, okay, The Sopranos, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's clearly someone who is what they're not, well, David Chase was never suggesting this is a good guy, but they're saying he's a fascinating character. Yes. And you're either interested in it or not. They show some good parts of him and some bad parts of him. But clearly David was saying this is a dangerous person. And, and most likely it's not going to end well for him. Whereas I think with our show, I don't think we're presenting that at all. I think we're presenting a person who is like messy and difficult and not great, but also not terrible. I mean, not like not wholly terrible, not entirely ter terrible. There are there is room for growth there. Mm -hmm. and if you don't allow for that, it's like we have episodes of Sunny where people are always asking like, oh, would you change something in Sunny? And of course I would. If I had a time machine, I would go mm -hmm. back and go like, oh, I never thought about it like that. And mm -hmm. what we were intending, the intent of what we were going for, is not what actually came across. And people are. And I understand that now, but I didn't know that at the time for whatever reason. The blind spot. It's that I had it's it's that's fascinating to me. I had I, I I was working on this just to because I just did this with your show. I have to uh, out my with the uh, episode about um, fast forwarding through that yeah. standalone episode. I just made a meaning that you didn't intend. Um, but uh, one time I had this joke because I'm doing this big bit about how phones are so much safer for kids. Kids are safer than they've ever been. We grew up on like you know our slides were like sheet metal they would bake in the sun like we didn't have we played on seesaws and played fucking bloody knuckles and shit mm -hmm. which is kind of secretly my theory about the rings it's mm -hmm. like um uh what are those things and brass knuckles brass it's like every like guys are kind of programmed to want brass knuckles and when i looked at his i was like I, he should probably just wear brass well, knuckles that's probably what he's like connecting to about it i if you i can go down we can, we can go down the ring road for a second put it all the way to you Okay. Yeah, guys. Guys don't like rings unless they're newer rings. Well, no, the ring, the rings, the beard, like what? It, it's just like a, a way to distance yourself, even in minor ways, from the world. Also, the Chris Angel joke came at the perfect time. Yeah. It was like the perfect time to do that joke. Like anyone else would have put it in the first episode. It was like perfectly timed. Um, but I was working this joke about how kids, um, oh, kids play with their phone. They're really dangerous. Okay, we played with matches. Like we played, we put paper bags on our heads. Like we played, let's go jump off that thing. We mm -hmm. played, hold your breath. And then matches would, sometimes it would kill and sometimes it wouldn't. And finally a comment came up to me and was like, when I picture matches, I picture them not lighting. Mm -hmm. Whereas I picture going, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was like, you were picturing a different thing. Like my yes. setup was flawed because I couldn't do the mind share that made everybody's mind yes. go to the same exact image. Yes, yes, and so, you know, when I was 27 years old and I would never, even at 27 and probably at 17 or 15, maybe 15, I don't know, but I would never write a joke that was like punching down, right, right. on a marginalized group. However, that's, in retrospect, you look back and you go, oh, that's not what we were intending, but because of the language we were using, the, that is what, what mm -hmm. winds up happening. And so, okay, you can either pull the episode and act like it never, never right, happened, right? Right, right. Which seems dark to me. Which that is, seems really dark. Which is, again, is a lot of history erasure stuff. I yes. mean, this, I'm not going to get involved in the statue debate, but it's like where, if we erase all the stuff from history books and get rid of all these books in schools, like how are they ever going to know that this has happened yes. before? But right, so the, I think there's a difference between pretending something like didn't happen or mm -hmm. continuing to celebrate it, mm -hmm. right? So I don't think by having the show exist... Uh, on a platform is saying, well, we're still celebrating the very specific blind spot in season three of this mm -hmm. show. As long as you can go back and retroactively look at it and say, 
oh, okay, we can ameliorate that thing. Mm -hmm. And the way that we can is by having one of the characters recognize that, oh, right, that was not what my intent was. My intent was this. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that in Sunny the characters learned anything. It means that we as a show did. And then how can we get creative to, to, to right that wrong while also dancing the line of not changing the character because that would be inauthentic and yet still getting our audience and the general audience to recognize that we as the filmmakers have, have learned something really important. And it's not just with like quote unquote woke shit. Uh, it's also like, like you said, like we've been really careful about not assuming that like people that voted for Trump are dumb or working class people are dumb. Um, and what's really interesting about Sonny is that I'll go, let's say to a frat house in South Carolina. I've probably you know, been to there. Right? And, and they'll be like, or I don't hang out in a lot of frat houses, but I mean like, <laughs> you know, I, I'll, I'll run into a bunch of frat boys, right. right? And they'll say, how do you make that show in LA? And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, you just fucking rip apart like woke culture and, and Between liberals. all the times you're going to drink the baby blood, how do yeah. you even have the time? Yeah, and I'm like, wow, is that what you think the show is? And they're like, clearly. And then I'll talk to my more liberal friends. Obviously I'm surrounded by them here. And they'll say, oh, how like, like you are really like, how do you go to South Carolina and walk around and talk to those kids? You're like really ripping them apart. And I'm like, really, is that what you think the show is? So I think everybody sees the show in a different light. Yeah. We're either ripping apart like neoliberalism or neoconservatism. And the truth is we're, we're doing both and mm -hmm. neither. And it's like whatever you project onto it. Will Ian have that in the show where he'll look back at a game and go like, ugh. Oh, Do we yeah. delete a dying? It's, okay, we're on. <laughs> I knew him since childhood when okay. that, well, he was Ian. Like, and go back and say, like, oh God, like I'm, or someone, you know, we'll look at something in retrospect. Or is there ever any crossover? Ever because it'd be funny if Ian's favorite show was Sunny, but it's it started sucking after season three, man. It started like sucking after, after he did that dance with the, the with, yeah, <laughs> but which like I get a lot when of. When it started not having the whatever jokes that you look back that you think you might delete. Oh, we we have yeah. Well, we have people who really think that we jumped the shark. Um, we jumped the shark sixteen times. That's but so ridiculous. When I did an episode where I did this like four minute long contemporary dance, and, they, <laughs> and like straight up people are like, "That's when they ruined it." I'm like. Okay. Well, I know where you. I know where you stand. I know yeah. the way that you were watching the show. I know that you can't. Show. You can't just sit in your uh, cringe awkwardness yeah. moment. I know you constantly need like yeah. a million cuts a minute to be able to not have be alone with your own thoughts. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think that we're already starting to do that with the show and with Ian, where he's able to um, let Poppy in in a way that he hasn't. And I think that that's that shows some level of maturity and growth. But but I also don't. I want to make sure that it's. Um, that it feels authentic to someone's real experience, mm -hmm. which is that he's not all of a sudden gonna go, oh, now I get it, mm -hmm. and then change his character completely. And I think in a lot of ways, I'm sure this will come out wrong, it is also comedians and comedy's job to sort of, to, to take a risk when it's like, you know, this comedian's not funny, some huge comedian. It's like, okay, so you're saying all the people in there laughing are dumb? Mm -hmm. They're, then why are they all laughing if he's not funny? You yeah. know. So to me, I think Ian's the same thing with anything. They're not making another Black Panther because they feel sorry for the actors or anyone. It's because it made a ton of money. Mm -hmm. You know. So it's it's not what does it say about the person making it? What what does it say about all the people buying it? Yeah. You know. So are we supposed to give people what they want? Or are we supposed to give people what they should want? You know. And so to me, a lot of the times in this in this moment where everyone's like, you can't say anything. It's I'm going to say it, but then I'm. If it's not funny anymore, that means they're done. Yeah. That means that, that you know, so there's something kind of fascinating, like what we laugh at says so much about who sure. we are as a person. Well, that's what species. we're always asking ourselves is like, okay, fine, break it down to is the- Is it funny for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? Exactly. Break it down to the physics. What's the joke? Mm -hmm. Like ultimately, what's, what are you saying? What's, what are you saying? What's, yes. What's the, what's the joke? And I'm fascinated, bringing up James Gandolfini, I'm fascinated by characters that if they do the wrong things for the wrong reasons, we hate them. But if they do the wrong things for the right reasons, if you're in the mafia to feed your kids, you know, it's, there's yeah. there's something, I think that's the little hook to get someone. Like Ian, uh, Ian so clearly like loves giving people an escape from their reality. It's so important to him. Mm -hmm. There's something, um, I don't know, just so charming about that to me. Well, for whatever reason, like people love, and I've just noticed this in the stuff that I watch, People love audiences. I love, as an audience member, I love to watch somebody who's really good at something. Yes. Like that's the number one, that's such an, a fascinating character trait that seems so simple, but it's mm -hmm. right. Like whether they're, whether they're good at slaughtering people mm -hmm. or they're good at making a video game mm -hmm. or they're good at being uh, a, 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 Cobbler. a sassy waitress. Yeah, like yeah. You're just like, 
oh wow, that I I enjoy watching them be good at that. And thing. well, because I think to me, it, it, inherent perfectionists are people that want to be the best at what they do. You're like, okay, I'm never gonna be the best at that, so I can just enjoy this. Is that me? I don't yeah, understand yeah. what's happening. Oh, um, uh, I could never do that, so I don't have to worry about ever being good at it. Mm -hmm. Like I really love watching, you know, um, what is it, water polo? Because I'm like, I would never want to do this. I don't like this, but I love watch it. Like with comedy, it's hard to watch because I'm like, oh, I auditioned for that, or I could have done that better, and it just takes the kind well. Of that's joy why out of it. you also find that like most people who work in comedy don't watch a lot of comedy, which is a bummer because it can only make you better. Right. It's just that you get kind of. Burnt out. I watch old comedy a lot. I definitely watch old shows. I Me still too. watch Martin. I still like stuff Incredible. like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, question ancestry. I'm obsessed with ancestry. Benton, do you want to come and ask your questions real quick? Oh, sure. Um, uh, what would Ian's 23 and Me come back as? Viking ancestry. Well, I think that's actually really funny. I know. That's a. That, uh, ooh, we should. <laughs> I'm gonna steal that because I think there's something really funny about uh, getting the results back and not. He makes the whole uh, office do it. Yeah, because yeah, I want to be yes. able to. I want to be able to forgive you because you might have ancestral trauma that I don't know about. And yes. if you, if you're, if I think that you're, you know, um, it's funny to say to uh, a partner's character, what's uh, a partner? Michelle. 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 Like. You could have Nazi ancestry. That could yeah. be why you're so stoic. Yeah. And I would, I wouldn't take this personally if I just understood your epigenetic imprinting and what you came from. I, I, I have you. I love this idea. Because I have. I, I, maybe we can cut this, and I'll pay you for that. Because that's actually that's really incredible. Like, the idea of we do it. We did a version of that this year where we had everybody take a test, and then it it, it told you what animal you would be, and mm -hmm. then you'd be on this animal wheel. This is the second season, uh. and um, and I. And it, it's a great it, it's a great episode. It's a bottle episode that's just all the characters interacting, right. and it's fun because it has reduced you down to an animal, mm -hmm. and then that's really fun because I can be like, well, you're a baboon or you're a, a shark, or yeah, right, you're, right, right, right. And so there's something fantastic about actually breaking everybody's DNA yeah. down yeah. only to just just what, so I can get a better sense of who you are. This is what you're wired to do. Yeah. I should make you be doing this. Yeah, you, and you he would definitely this. lie about it, right? A hundred percent. He'd be like, I Genghis Khan is my dad. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I actually think that that's a good, and that's a good thing. Yes. The one that raped 6,000 women a week? Well, Well, he that's conquered a, that's a lot a of territory. Word. There weren't many humans at the time. He's the reason, you know, we didn't go extinct. Um, but that's fascinating to me. Also, uh, I do feel, first of all, David Hornsby. Yeah. Just real, I, I, I'm like obsessed with his ancestry. It'd be funny if he had Nazi ancestry, and he's like, "Yeah, why am I such a pussy? Like, I've got a Nazi ancestry." And he's just like, "Let's go." <laughs> he, he's am, he's amazing. Be a savage. Amazing. He, what, the, when the the read of the line when he got fired, when he's like, "It's hard to get a job as a white man." I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> that was like like Lisa Kudrow almost yeah. uh, uh, level. He, what I find with David is like people, like general audiences, they find characters that they love, and Charlotte's fucking incredible and there's so many Joe is so funny Joe, play, as played by Jesse Ennis there's so many great characters but people in comedy that I talk to like if they watch the show um, David is the one where they because he's doing so much I don't know that, how you keep a straight face yeah. I do see a lot of singles on him though <laughs> I'm like is this just I could never yes. be in a two shot with yeah, him keep it just kills me yeah he's so funny um, I also just want to say real quick uh, that you are a hero in my eyes because you made the only Small Wonder joke I've ever approved of. Small Wonder was my favorite, favorite show growing up. I pers based my entire personality on her. Mm -hmm. And so I wore this special shirt for you today. I appreciate that. I watched, I've probably seen every episode of Small Obsessed. Wonder. Obsessed. Yeah. Obsessed. I have the costume to wear for Halloween. It's, uh, it's wild. Remember like Mr. Belvedere? Remember like, I mean, all these shows. Yeah. Imagine pitching. When people make b references to television shows, I can promise you I've seen every Can you episode. pitch me Three's Company? Right now I'm an executive. Well... I think about this quite a bit. Me too. <laughs> it's all I, it's all I do. Quite a bit. <laughs> no. I think about like what was that? What was the pitch, pitch meeting of, of Three's Company? It's about we're 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 a writing team. Okay. Well, it's about these two beautiful women. I mean, one's really beautiful. Wait, and sorry. Can I interrupt for a second to ask a question? Of it, what <sighs> decade are we? Are we pitching it in 2021 or are we yeah, pitching it in 1970? Okay. 2021. Because you, you pitch it in two different ways. Because if it's 1979, you're like two hot chicks. You're using yeah, yeah. One's two dumb, hot one's whores. smart. Well, but one's you don't, got short hair, so she's like a you, butch dyke. You don't want to fuck the one, but you want to yeah. fuck the other one. Yeah. But the one is a sourpuss, because yeah. <laughs> she's funny, because she's a sourpuss. The one's really dumb. <laughs> and then we got a guy, and the joke is mm -hmm. that 
that we're going to pretend a, he's a, that he... He's a pansy. Yeah, he's a pansy. The joke is... <laughs> he's one of the queers. Yes, he's one of them queers. And the, uh, he's and a the, fudge packer. And the... Uh, and the, the um, And then there's a guy named Larry. The manager Larry. doesn't... Yeah, well, Larry. Well, Larry, and he's just funny because... Oh he's my slaves. God, Zar. Yeah. Well, Larry slays. Comes in, says, yes, slays no, the, the with the ladies, yeah. He's yeah. the Genghis Khan of wherever right. that took place. That's right. And we're going to have him constantly trying to fuck these women, but they don't want to fuck him. Mm -hmm. But but he's going to go out there and he's going to, or at least he thinks he's slaying out there. And then the landlord yeah. is older, which means he's like a manic mess because old people are just dumb and crazy all the time, you yeah. know, so everyone will relate to that. Yeah. And, uh, but we're gonna give him sort of like an effeminate flair too for no apparent <laughs> he kind of reason. He's wearing a house dress and yeah. it's sort of progressive looking back. <laughs> even though, yeah, even though the whole joke was that he thought, that, yeah, it was a little confusing there. Because Mr. Furley would wear like, Collared, um, like Phyllis Diller, yeah, uh, scarves. scarves and whatnot. I wonder if that, I'm always fascinated by how something like that comes about. Like, you know, there's a story about Leonardo DiCaprio where in um, uh, Revenant, he chose, because it was an 11 month shoot and they were only using all natural yep. light, that whole thing. And he chose fingerless gloves. And then like a month into the shoot, he was like, I, 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 I'm freezing. Yeah. Like, well, that's it. But when actors make a choice, or you do something to fix something else, and then the story behind why it was like that, if, yeah. if he had like gotten surgery on his neck and they had to do that, and then I just loved that, that yeah. like trivia stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I I think that's a sale in '79. I don't think that's a sale in uh, even even Pretty Woman. I mean, she was supposed to die at the end. Like, I just I love that shit. I love those little tidbits. Pitch. The, Give it. The, Let's go. We don't. We don't have to pitch it, but I. I'm all oftentimes picturing the 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 pitch room of Golden Girls because it's wild. Like wild. there's no way that you're an any executive, women were on. First of all, there were no women um, women on that staff. I guess. Well, Susan Harris cre oh, created. Oh yeah, that's it. right. Oh, that's right. She created it, but I don't know that she stayed. I mean, I know on. some writers that wrote on it. Because Paul Junger Witt, I think, was like the. The, the executive producer, but like Gary David Goldberg was on that before. Yeah, I was. Well, it's interesting because I do think there's something, this is gonna get me in trouble, but there's something cool about when men write women and women write men, because we actually, you know, we, when we say only men can write women, men and only women can write women, it's like, that's so ignorant and assuming that, um, that masculinity and femininity can't exist in others. So to me, I love when guys write for me because they're not like, how's my hair? Because yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's like, there's something, they do write you, me like a man. Do you know, and I have do a you very masculine the, personality. the other person that you were with who I met at the party, at the CAA party 12 years ago? You were with him. He's probably- Oh, Michael Patrick King? Michael Patrick Yes, King. yes, yes. Who yes. very famously I mean for, knows yeah. I mean I'm like can you just write this for me write my vows write like write the, everything yeah I, I did sort of feel a little bit like um, uh, everyone's gonna project their own thing onto this but I you know I and Poppy I'm like that's kind of me and Michael <laughs> you know cool. kind of cool um, but we were gonna talk about Sonny uh, and well, first I want to ask you are these the gifts you gave him Yes, yes, they are for his wife, not him. Oh. They're for his wife's uh, uh, emotional spiral into rescuing cats, which is an addiction. You can't stop. Okay. Just right. want to double check. Guy, yeah. do you have notes for my gifts? <laughs> so many. But what we'll, am I going to get We'll do it him? later. He owns a soccer team. I, I, I we'll do a it. soccer ball. It would have been a great option. No, I huh? feel like he's got plenty of we those. Got, we have a few of those. You know I, what he does not have? A tinfoil hat for cats. <laughs> no, but we do have animal puzzles but i like this one that one's like super cool i got a place called boo radley's in spokane washington it's like the coolest boo radley's, that's yeah cool. yeah um the coolest toy store on the planet and they just it's like spencer's gifts but like sick but like to kill a mockingbird style yes like, exactly like, like, a, a, <laughs> like attica scout sure. and yeah okay. the whole thing everything's um yeah i just i'm a hoarder also i i noticed and if i don't give you those i'm gonna get a cat just to put the hat on something okay so this is gonna stop we'll me from becoming a cat lady okay I love that. Ben did said something really profound about your character on Sunny, and I feel like you should say it, not me. Yeah, I was just, your character on Sunny is so interesting because, one, it portrays a gay male. It's really one of the only, in my opinion, examples of like a masculine gay male on television. And also, a, that's has not really very, if any, stereotypes attached to it. Mm -hmm. And was that like a choice that you made, or did that happen because you had a character first that just happened to be gay later. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably the honest answer, yeah, is that, it, like, I, he, very clearly in the very beginning, he was a straight man, or at least what we, 
we retroactively justify that he was in the closet and like and hiding this for various reasons. But but yes, I originally started playing him just as a straight man, and then when we but we made a concerted concerted effort to make sure that once we did transition into not only suggesting but then having him come out uh, and admit to being gay that we didn't change him we didn't change his character and people could still make fun of definitely him. and hate then him. that's not yes. that's not treating you as an equal that's saying you're too fragile mm -hmm. for me to joke with that's right and so we do make it very clear that the characters are like we hate you like we dislike you mm -hmm. but not and we don't want to spend any time with you, but not because you're gay. We don't <laughs> give a fuck yeah. about whether you're yes, gay. Yes, yes. It's, it's you we don't mm -hmm. like. And and that's what we what I found is just really <laughs> awesome, like about the community too, and and the embrace that I've I've felt over the years that and and that that I get more often than not, which is thank you for not changing the character into maybe what could be perceived as or actually be just virtue signal bullshit. Yeah. So we really try to actively fight against that and make sure that the character itself, he, he's exactly like them, just like D, right? So like mm -hmm. D's a woman, yep. but we didn't like change her. We didn't want her to be- You were we like, when she's getting her nails done, she tried, You were just. she was just a, one of you guys. That's right. So it's like we want, the characters are, are not real human beings. They're, they're id, right? Mm -hmm. Like manif manifested id. So like, D is a female version of this manifested id, and so Mac is a gay version of that. And why, why can't the, a gay man also be as abhorrent as the rest of these characters? That yeah, yeah it, why can't they? It's yeah. the real question. It's like, well, it's like what David Oyelowo said when he was on the podcast. He was like, if you're a black filmmaker, it has to win an Oscar. We're not, we're not equal until we can make mediocre movies like everybody yeah. else. Well, it just seems like you wrote a gay character that's not for straight people also. Like it's not, a lot of gay characters are written, I think, to be digestible for straight people, to make you feel bad for gay people, to make you mm -hmm. empathize for gay, with gay people. And they're wrote, they're written for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas well, this character- they only show their trauma. Yeah, it's, like their it's trauma all about, form. yeah, it's about like, how can I make you feel bad for this person so that it betters their life in the real world, which isn't Doesn't necessarily work. accurate. Whereas this character is like still really flawed yeah yeah and really messed up and is that was i mean that was a choice or that's oh just... yeah yeah no that was definitely a choice like we, we wanted to make again we wanted to make sure that it felt authentic to the show mm -hmm. so that i don't know if this is because i grew up in the community or and i'm sure it absolutely has a lot to do with that but um i was it was just always normalized to me because everybody i knew was was gay or at least 50 percent of the people i knew were gay so mm -hmm. it wasn't and even though i went to catholic school it seemed like my friends didn't care and they all were all aware of it it just mm -hmm. didn't seem like it was that big of a of a deal and then i moved from philly to new york and then all of my friends in new york were so yes i i i could recognize that um that obviously um the lgbtq community was IA. marginalized ia IA. IA. No, like, whatever. Don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm doing my best. <laughs> no, uh, was thing. marginalized. I, I could recognize that, right, from uh, from an from an objective standpoint, but it didn't. I wasn't always like feeling it. Nevertheless, I wanted to make sure that once we went down this direction with the show, that um, that we were. I hate using this word because it's 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 terrible mm -hmm. out of context, but it's true that we wanted to normalize, yeah. right? So that the only way to normalize it in the context of Sonny was to make sure that the character was exactly the way he was prior to, mm -hmm. to, to coming out. But I would say, you know, look, if you have the, the I've, I've heard a lot of criticism about Will and Grace, the original Will and Grace, you know, recently, which I think is fascinating because people are looking at it from the lens, like specifically Sean's character, looking at it through the lens of 2021, right? Mm -hmm. Where maybe he was like, that character was reinforcing stereotypes or whatever it might be. But that's fucking bullshit because that show to me, I don't know how you guys feel about that show, but like to me, single handedly did um, for the community what I what I could only dr dream of doing like w in the, in the mid to late 90s we're basically saying like these are people just like you welcome welcome them into your neighbor into your living room every once a week and you can see that the the thing the things that they're going through are the same things that you're going through and so again using that word like normalizing the community um, I think was like super profound so any like little thing yes, that I can do to continue that. That is true. But I think that Hollywood took that, that really good thing, and now they've made, that's not, now the blueprint. Yeah. You now are gay and you're a sidekick to a sassy woman. You don't have a love interest. You end up alone. You're, you're mm -hmm. killed off. You're yeah. like, there's, they take that, as long as you can be, that you can better the life of a straight person, you're a great character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting to have a show where you portray 
um, a, a character that's flawed and that's masculine and that is synonyms. Yeah, just lots of synonyms. <laughs> Those two, we're done then. But um, I lost my train of thought on that when you spoke, but I had a point. <laughs> that's kind of my thing. <sighs> it's a power move. Can I, as you're saying that, I want to. Yeah, go I ahead. Just back I remember what it was. Yeah, we were saying that as long as it uh, uh, betters the life of yes. the straight character, mm -hmm. uh, it's also always has to steal the scene, has to come in, say the funniest thing, and then like can't. Also, just they have be nothing to live for but like being helping improving your life. Yeah. Like I mean, like, if you fashion advice, like something's wrong with you, they make you a spicy drink. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> it's always something like that. Where it's like it's very rare to see a character that's like one like kind of like a, like a lead or in the lead ensemble that's not struggling and or all of their jokes are based or... on being gay they have nothing else going on with their life they don't have any allergies they don't you know have a house being renovated it's just like everything goes back to gay 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 that's or only... sex or being obsessed with men which i noticed your character doesn't have a love interest nobody in the really has a love interest really well, no one will love them no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that, that's a conscious choice yes. ah <laughs> Please have been rolling on that. Jeez. Take two. Just so you guys know how authentic we are. Wait, yeah. I haven't given a, hold on. I haven't lectured you guys in a while about how authentic we are about our sponsors and who we work with. We don't work with anybody where we don't actually use their products. So much so that Emily <laughs> went to go take out the outstanding foods uh, meal in a bag puffs and guess what? They were open. <laughs> Because I was really eating them. I'm not going to eat them now because you guys get mad when I do my nom noms on the microphone. <laughs> and I'm trying to hold these very delicately so everyone out there with misophonia doesn't have a panic attack and, and get in a car accident mm -hmm. on, the, on the interstate. <laughs> do you call it the interstate or the freeway? I call it the highway. I call it the highway, too. That's so weird. That's because we're from the same place. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, That'll do it. So, anyway, back to us being authentic and... Real. Real. Emily wants to play a game. Mm -hmm. Emotional games aside, we do that at night. What do you want to do on the show? What kind of game do you want to play now? This is a fun game. Called? I like to call Ride or Die. Okay. I'm going to read off some rumored celeb rider requests, and yes. you're going to tell me who you think it is. Multiple choice. Okay. Like a rider, like how... It's a writer's a list of things that celebrities request to have backstage for them when they do things. Like right. when you're like Jennifer Lopez, right, right, right. White Orchid. Right, right, like right, right. The game is such a clever title. Rider die. Mm -hmm. Get it? Like Yeah, no, I saw you laughing in, at your computer earlier when you were writing this. If it's not in there, they'll kill you. <laughs> yeah. Ride or die. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Well. okay. All right, here we go. Okay. First one. Okay. Not all this worked for the <laughs> bosses you had. Okay. You were one of them. Okay. <laughs> 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 that would have just been by accident. Okay. Yogurt pretzels, licorice, sour candy, and Advil liquid gels. Is this Kylie Jenner, Andy Dick, or Meghan Markle? Meghan Markle has a rider? Uh, Advil? Liquid gels. That sounds like Andy Dick. He's always like falling all over the place and getting punched in the face. <laughs> Kylie Jenner. Oh, really? Which to me seems so reasonable. Uh, Advil? Yeah, yeah, it does. You know, I thought it was going to be like 10... Little people. <laughs> the person who doesn't let me say Eskimo on the show. I didn't say dwarf. Or <laughs> that's the right thing. Why? Would, because they have lots of kids. <laughs> I'm just like. Because it's absurd. Just and to, like an aerialist. Just to throw her Advil's out. <laughs> see if they can catch them in their mouths. <laughs> to juggle them. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, to put sombreros on, to put salsa and chips. <laughs> Guac. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Next mm. one. One grande iced caramel latte with two sweet and lows. One grande iced Americana with two sweet and lows and soy milk. And one slice of pumpkin loaf. Is this Beyonce, Taylor Swift, or the, <laughs> <laughs> or the mermaid from Starbucks? <laughs> you guys, Emily has been laughing at this joke that she wrote for the last two and a half hours, and she cannot even get through it. The mermaid from the cup. <laughs> It's, there's nothing funny about this. I, it's so funny oh. to her that we're just, we're not sure what to do except just let her have it. So guess. <laughs> the mermaid from Starbucks? 
<laughs> it's Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift and needs banana pumpkin uh, in her rider? Yeah. That makes me love her even more. I know. I love, oh God, Taylor, if you ever watch this, I love you. Taylor, you know what you do need? Outstanding foods. Okay. Last one. <clears throat> Tell me which celeb this is <laughs> whose rider reads. Take one. your time, Emily. This ad's only been seven and a half minutes. <laughs> One bag of pig out pigless pork rinds in Texas barbecue flavor. One bag of pig out pigless pork rinds in nacho cheese flavor. That is nacho bag. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> One bag. This of is nacho <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One bag of pig out pigless pork rinds in hella hot flavor. One bag of pig out pigless pork rinds in salt and vinegar flavor. One bag of pig out pork rind. One bag of pig out pigless pork rinds in original flavor. And grace. <laughs> <laughs> that is my rider, and I am not ashamed of it. This is always what I eat on the road. All of their products are GMO free, gluten free, free of artificial ingredients, trans fats, cholesterol, and soy, and are certified kosher, certified plant based, and certified gluten free. If that's not Joe style, I don't mess with you. We worked out an exclusive deal for Good For You listeners. Receive 25% off your first order. Go to outstandingfoods.com slash Whitney or use code Whitney at checkout to claim this deal. Do you know that also has iron and vitamin D and minerals? This is literally what vitamin D is what you're supposed to be taking during the pandemic. Just saying. That's O-U-T-S-T-A-N-D-I-N-G-F-O-O-D-S dot com slash Whitney. It's here at Good For You. We're showers and not tellers, so we would like to show you some video footage of what I used to be like on tour before I started drinking Coors Pure. <laughs> I'm just sitting there, miserable, bored, distraught, no fun at all. Look at me, dorky sweatpants. What do you, oh a pair of sunglasses on my head that doesn't even block the sun. Just got those to try to look cool, because I can't act cool, so I try to cheat it with cool sunglasses. That's how lame I am, pre-Coors Pure. And now here's a video of Whitney. Now that I've discovered Coors Pure, At this is me now. This is Whitney now. Turned down for what? <laughs> look at that. <laughs> oh, you giving out money? I'm just, no, it's invisible money. It's invisible money. Wait, you didn't see my dance at the end. Yeah. Oh, wow. Coors Pure makes you an incredible dancer. That, I think we can agree on and that. that is scientifically those proven. those moves. I do feel like Coors Pure, I'm not a wine person. It's too mm -hmm. heavy for me. I get headaches the next, next day. This is the perfect buzz because it's, it's not too much. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I feel like I was dancing but with the girls. Right. That's the buzz that I want. Making friends in the bathroom. Making friends in the bathroom. You know, like, it's not the kind of buzz where you get drunk and you're like, she's prettier than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who do you think you are? Like, right. it was like, I was the best version of myself with no dark thoughts. Right, right. I believe Coors Pure, when I drink it, it brings out the best in me. I love that. Not the worst in me. I love that. And you've never seen me on it. <laughs> I, I, I would cannot. love to see, please drink that whole can. <laughs> uh, it is a refreshingly simple beer with organic barley, organic hops, and water. That's it. No garbage, no trash. 92 calories and zero sugar. Coors Pure is the perfect beer to celebrate everyday wins of life. Uh, so when you oh, want oh, to enjoy oh. a beer without the guilt, reach for Coors Pure. It's organic, but chill about it. Go to really Coors. Does feel so light. Go to CoorsPure.com slash Whitney to see where you can find Coors Pure. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company of Albany, Georgia. And the can's not embarrassing. Mm-mm. I'm -mm. saying it's like chic. It's cute. Yeah. It matches all my horse shirts. <laughs> the mountain. That's what we look for in a beverage. <laughs> We're doing an episode right now that we're writing um, and that, that, that basically all the characters become, but very specifically Mac becomes obsessed with his identity and, and how he identifies. And to your point, that's something we talk about all, of, all the time, which is like the, the joke shouldn't be that he, his character shouldn't just be based on the fact that he's gay. Right. And that's what you traditionally see. And mm -hmm. that was your point, which is like, oh, well, that's the joke. The joke is he's gay. So, no, the joke is that for Mac specifically is that whether or not he jumps head first into that is kind of an indictment and then a satire on basically that framing. So, for example, the way that Mac looks at himself, they were like, OK, Mac, it kind of the 23 and me thing kind of like was a, a version of what we're talking about, which is like, I'm going to try and 
define who I am. So Max, like, okay, I define myself by, by, by three guiding principles. Like number one, I identify as badass. Like that's number one. <laughs> number two, I identify as Irish Catholic. <laughs> uh, so badass number one, Irish Catholic number two, and then gays number three. And so, and anything that gets like in, in between, you know, the number one, mm -hmm. like is going to be a problem. And I think Mac would rather be badass than he, than gay. And that's why this show's so fucking weird and fucked up and strange. Mm -hmm. So he's always going to be gay. He's like, but I just happen to be gay. That has nothing that, to do that's with That's right. This. I just happen to be this, but in the same way that I just happen to be a badass. And, it, but the point <laughs> is that everybody uh, like rolls their eyes and they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Because I have Lyme yeah, disease. Well, why are we talking about yeah, that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, just in the way that I think Will and Grace was really influential for their time, I kind of feel like Sunny is that way now. Because I'm one of the people who I believe allies are probably the most important part of any movement because they can get to people that you can't get to. Right. That people will listen to them for whatever reason, like because you can relate. And I think that's kind of what your character is doing now in this generation in a lot of ways. And you have a lot of guys I, mean, I know, but yeah, th yeah, that's what my, my question is, do you feel like that affects things? I know my friend, Zach, he's like, you're like his hero, and like he will literally say things, like he wants to be right, all this stuff, and he'll say things like, well, Rob wouldn't say that, or Rob wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Or like, and, and the impact of just seeing that character evolve has, inf I think, affected a lot of like bros. I spent people <laughs> that are ma massive guys that are like your that were beaten up saying you cannot be gay. I know a lot of them went to convert that are now you know masculine just the idea of like I got to push it down I just got to punch as many guys as I can a week to not deal with what's going on with me yeah. it's like you know people think that all you know gay people have come out of the closet by 18 there's a whole generation of men that have had to sort of overcompensate with like hyper masculinity in order to not deal with that because there wasn't you know a ways to see yourself on Instagram and IGTV and TikTok and stuff like that there, th that wasn't available to them you yeah. know so I also love that it's happening at a late stage in his life because most people don't get to come out at 12 and just be unconditionally supported by their parents the way we see on yeah and, and and we also chose to i think like i think the character came the joke is that the character look all of the characters are completely um uh, have no sense of of themselves and they're completely not self-aware in any way and so um at one point uh, I think the character came out and there was like, I, I noticed on social media, there was like, like literally came out to his friends and there was this big social media um, push to me um, that everybody was like really excited. And then I was like, oh shit, because I know that we have this other episode where he goes back in the closet. And we thought, well, that's, it, it, to us, it was interesting for the show to watch this guy struggle with this where he just goes out and comes back in and goes out and comes back in. And meanwhile, all of his friends are like, we, we, we don't care. Like, you don't, you, mm -hmm. you just stop telling us this. Just yeah. do whatever you want. We don't care. And then when we put him back into the closet, I, the outpouring was really devastating to me because people were really sad and upset. And I never thought about it that way. I never thought about Sonny as maybe being... Um, being a show that the community would embrace the way that, that, that they actually did, mm. which is why we in the season after um, where I just put it, basically put it to bed was like, I want to do something that Sonny never does. Uh, and we changed the tone of an entire sequence uh, of the show that was probably, um, I mean, w one of the most important uh, s sequences in the show as far as I'm concerned in the, in the 14 years. And it was the thing that probably brought me the most joy. Mm. Um, and that was this, this, coming out to my father sequence that we did. And then from that point forward, um, what I've been hearing the most, it isn't necessarily just from the community, which obviously feels good, uh, but it's, I'll be around town or I'll be, I'll be on social media. And the first thing I'll hear is, um, bro, I'm not gay, but, Right? People and love to start sentences. They like love that. it. Okay. And and normally they'll say <laughs> I that. I don't usually think women are funny. Yeah. But, but right. I'm not gay, but I think you're really funny. Great. Okay. okay. So here's <laughs> <laughs> So here's the thing. I see that now I can absolutely recognize that a person who's been marginalized their whole life could hear that and just be like, What the fuck? However, I, I'm I would suggest that this represents great growth from somebody from large sections of the population who needed that, like need to use that verbiage to, yes, they're hedging to a certain extent, but then they are saying, I'm not gay, but you did this episode and it meant something to me. Like I cried at the end of this episode. I felt something that I haven't felt before. And I'm like, oh, wow. And then you 
follow up on the conversations and they're not maybe ready to continue down that road. But it feels as though you cracked a little bit of that armor. Right. You are having an impact on a group of people that is very hard to get to. Yeah. Like in the way that Will and Grace did. And I think that's why earlier you mentioned how you have a, a, a larger female fan base now. I think that's why. I think you kind of represent like, like to women and to people that are othered what like straight white men can be, what they should, but how they can really be if they mm -hmm. have tools and that they aren't like so hung up on being like toxic and masculine and being all these things that we, all these words we throw around. I think that's probably why there's such a huge shift in well, that. Well, I, I hope so. I mean, I, it's certainly the characters themselves are not, um, are, are not vessels for that, but I think the audience, going back to what we're, you were saying earlier, which is like giving the audience the benefit of the doubt that they're smarter than you think. Yeah. That people are watching the show and they recognize that well, the characters are one thing, but the filmmakers are something else, mm -hmm. and that they're going along that ride with us. And if if I'm that or a version of that, and I can kind of infuse the show with that, then people get it, right? It's not, the show shouldn't be taken on face value. And if I'm that, it's only because of the way I was raised. So I have the benefit, again, I, I, it's not that I don't have judgment on people who feel the way that they feel, let's just say they're homophobic, for example. Okay, of course, do I want them to be homophobic? No. I, me, I, I had the luxury and the pleasure of being raised in the community, so it was always something to me that I had access to and had information on and had relationships with. And so it was easy for me to, like, you hit a certain point where you're like, oh, I, I didn't realize that anybody actually felt any way other than this because I've always been in yeah. the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. I try, again, not to be too <laughs> judgmental. Like, I thought it was fine until I came to Hollywood and realized everyone was racist and sexist <laughs> yes. and came, yeah. came, took coming well, here. There was truly a point in my life where I, this actually happened. I grew up in Philly, which is a majority black city, yep. in the gay community. I went to Temple uh, for summer school between... Okay, uh, right. So my high school was right next to Temple awesome. um, in North Philly. And then and then you went to school in West Philly. So, you, I mean, the, it's, it's majority black. So I remember being in like fourth grade. Mm -hmm and learning about the word minority, like what the word minority meant. Mm -hmm. And it was, oh, okay, and I remember asking the teacher, what does it mean? And she said, well, it means like a population that's in this context, that's less than or fewer than mm -hmm. in numbers. And so for an example, you are a, you will be a white man and therefore a, you are in a minority. And I was like, no, I'm not. That doesn't make any sense. And she's like, no, you're not understanding. You are a straight white man and not and the vast majority of people are not straight, uh, are straight white men. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's not true. That's not what that word means. And she's like, I don't think you understand what the word minority, and I said, no. I, as a straight white man, am a minority. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> she, yeah. and she was like, you don't understand what the word is. And I was like, I don't think you understand what the word is. Because it felt to me, and of yeah. course it wasn't true, but it's it so felt funny. to me like I was in the minority. I didn't feel oppressed in any way. Yeah, yeah. But I felt like... It's just math. What do you mean? You look around and yep. you're like, oh, this is just what the world is. It's and like so, Theo Vaughn has that great bit about that. Yeah, you grow up... Like, imagine growing up in the West Village of New York. Yeah. You just look around, you're... Two years old, and you're like, oh well, this is what life is, or the anywhere in New York City. Which is why it's so great to when people sort of want to roll their eyes, and why um, Disney movies that are diverse are so important, because that's when kids are really going, oh, this is what the world looks like. Yes. And then they go see a bunch of white people, and they're like, this is not what the world should look like. It looked diverse. You know, that's why. I, you know, I think people, mm -hmm. it's so important to have that in movies so that the world looks the way it ideally would. I mean, be. I just think a character like that is break. It, go, even going back to like the "I'm not gay, but" statement, I think that statement comes out of fear like I'm scared that if I like a female comic if I like a gay movie that it makes me in some way gay uh, yep yes. and it, even even going back to like like your statement earlier when you were talking about like men can't wear rings well that's impl men implied that you, they are the ones that said you can't wear rings what no one is else is that well because no, Benjamin used to work with Sephora because there's this whole thing where like men almost make their own fears like I'm scared that I'll be called the thing that I'm going to call you if Correct. you do the thing so you're that, you're running from your own you're chasing yes. your own tail you're running from your own shadow. Everyone's fine with no no one's no one's thinking about you at all. And then so just having a character like that and then listening to interviews like this with a person like you I think it, that is like more impactful than like Glad being like and we put a tap dancing gay in this show. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that's okay. <laughs> cool, but you got the term right in the show. It's like okay, who you know? But um, but did you were you on that call with Michelle Obama when she did a call to talk to showrunners? No. 
She did a. I a, wasn't invited to that she one. She did a, no, I, Here's the thing. I still have yet to find anyone who was on it. Apparently, uh, there was there was a call. I was on it where it was. Um, maybe you were fine. Maybe it was the, just you. And her. Had, I thought it was, it was just you and her talking. I dressed up. I wore a blazer, a green blazer, and it was like an audio call. And I was like, "What am I doing?" But I sat and um, she got on the call with a bunch of showrunners, still don't know who was on the call, probably just the ones that were like tisk tisking. And she said it was her last year in office and she wanted to make a big, the biggest impact she could in every way. And she said, we can now connect the success of the show Will and Grace to the passage of marriage equality. Mm -hmm. They looked at all the cities that had the highest numbers of watching it, and then they looked at how they voted. And so she said, can you please start putting different kind of characters in your show? Because we're finding this is what changes people, having them in their, your home, in your living room for you know years I at a time, and you time. investing in caring, because you go, oh, well, if, if Jack wants to get married, of course he should be able to get married. Yeah. And then they're not thinking gay people, they're thinking my friend Jack. Yeah, I tell you this all the time. Most people in middle America, like in, like in towns I grew up in, little towns like that, <sighs> what you see on TV is the world. That's how you learn how to hail a taxi. That's how I learned how to get on a plane. Mm -hmm. Like what you see on TV is the truth that's until you find out that it's not. Fascinating. Like so, what you're telling people on television, whether it's with Roseanne or with something else, that's real to them. Yeah. That's you're representing what they think. I think everyone you don't have, to have sex from watching because you, you don't just do have whatever you saw in movies. Yeah, because yeah. you don't have the resources or anything to leave towns like that a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So all you have is that. Like that's why. And like, or this is a theory, but like, that's why like in singing competitions, things like that, you notice that country artists tend to win a lot of singing competitions because people that work in areas that listen and live that way, they go home after work and watch television. They're, they vote, they have time to do those things. People that live in big cities, they're hustling, they're out, they're moving, they're, they're, they're seeing a lot more. They're but not they have time to be a, become good singers, you mean? No, I'm saying like, Fans, they have more fans because those people that like music like that, that like people like that, that like a hardworking Southern person on television, they go home and they watch sitcoms, they watch singing competitions, right. they watch The View, they mm -hmm. watch those shows. Yeah. Because there's what, what else are you gonna do? Right. Fascinating. And so, I mean, what you put out there is really important in that way. Yeah. It was just great to hear him say that. I'm letting you go. I'm gonna just ask one more thing. Okay. What have you said no to? Because you've had a million opportunities to be in big movies, stuff like. Have you ever said no to anything? That you're like, ah, fuck, I wish I'd done. That. I don't have, I don't have big opportunities to be in big movies. I don't have, I don't have a lot of incoming calls. That's so interesting. Do you think it's because you're, because this happens to me sometimes where people come up to me and they'll be like, I'd love to have you in this movie, but like I know you only do something if you make it. I'm like, no, I don't. I tend to only make it because. You guys keep telling me I'm too tall or too funny or not funny enough or not pretty enough or too pretty. Like, I just had to start writing things for myself. I'd love to do someone else's thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I have heard that before, which yeah. is like, oh, we thought you just do your own thing. They'll I'm say, like, do you want to be in this and come on as EP? Why would I not want to come? Yeah. You, the, a lot of the calls I'll get will be, hey, we have this script. It's shit. Um, but we uh, own it and we'll own it outright, but we'll pay you a nominal fee to come in and fix it for us. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Mm. Yes, I, wow. I'll pass on that. But very rarely do I get, um, oh, like, would you like to come in and... Act on this. Yes, act on this. Every once in a while, a bit, like friends will ask me to do cameos or something like that, but... But it's interesting because he has, because and I mean Fargo, you were unbelievable. Thanks. Fucking um, unbelievable. And uh, no, it's to me. People come up to me and they're like, "I love you to be in um, my movie, but like make it your own. Like do whatever you want." I'm like, "No, no, I want to do what you wrote. Yeah. Like I don't. This isn't my show. Like I would love to come be a guest and say you're writing, you know." And then they'll be like, "Was that okay? Do you want to see it?" I'm like, "I, I don't." Yeah, this is your thing. I yeah. would love nothing more than to come in at six and leave at seven mm -hmm. instead of come in at two a.m. Yeah, and yeah. leave at midnight. Yeah. <laughs> like I would love that, but it's I'm just I was just. Curious about that because well because you like, because you, you've proven yourself as a as a creator and as a boss and as an executive producer and so and also a performer and, but so you're looked at as those things first I think mm -hmm. and then no I was acting like a showrunner <laughs> yes I was acting like a writer well but di yeah, dirty yeah, secret yeah uh, do you, I mean that's what we all do yeah yes and that's yes. that's the biggest advice whenever anybody is asking me like well why do you have why do you, why do you, why how can you like how did you learn how to do this I'm like you don't you just guess and then you hopefully have some kind of mentorship mm -hmm. or you have some kind of like support system mm -hmm. but you're just faking it all the way through mm -hmm. and this is what I'm trying to impress upon as many young people that ask about like our positions and how do you get to the position I'm like you got to kind of push your way through it mm -hmm. and then you have to have the confidence in yourself to suggest that you can actually do the thing and then and just recognize that everybody nobody knows what they're doing mm -hmm. like literally nobody knows and I also recognize that I have the um, the luxury of being of navigating the world up to this point mm -hmm. in my late 20s where it truly was open for me even mm -hmm. though I didn't feel like it was because we grew up poor in Philly 
even poor in Philly, if you're a straight white dude, like the world opens itself to you in ways that, that other people it's not open to. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Like I truly didn't know that. And I think that's, that is the resistance to, um, to uh, white privilege that you hear quite a bit, which is like, fuck you, I worked for everything I have. Yeah. No one's no suggesting one's you didn't. That's right. No one's suggesting that your world, that your life wasn't harder. It wasn't hard as shit. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't as hard as other people based on these criteria. And there's that, no you know, reason you should really know that. How no, would you? Exactly. So I didn't recognize that or know that. So I had this, I probably have a certain amount of confidence that was sort of bestowed upon me by the culture mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of people don't that a lot of people don't have, and so either way, it's something I wasn't born with. Something you cultivate over time, mm -hmm. and I, I'm trying to like mentor some of the younger people on Mythic Quest and Sunny to like take ownership of that and then go do their own show. And I'm so I mean, I think you're doing that even with people that don't work for you. I know, like so many of my comic friends, like. You're like their hero. I mean, like I have a friend. He like just all he does is write like spec scripts for Sunny. He did one about about the zoo, and it like did really well on Reddit or something. Like, blew up on Reddit, <laughs> and then you guys did we that did zoo episode. episode. <laughs> you would have thought that you came to his house and gave him like a check. He was so thrilled about it, and I was like, I just think that like people are paying attention to like what people are doing. And I legal think nightmare that, to be clear, Rob never read it. I never read. <laughs> no never accepting read it submissions. Episode, yeah. It's illegal. Yeah. If you sent it, it goes straight to the lawyer. Oh, no, it's just on Reddit. Okay. Um, <laughs> But I, so it was publicly available. It's, there is this thing that I do where if I have to do like a big, big girl thing where I have to have a call with people or like ask for more money or like set a boundary, I really just go, how would I write the scene if my hero was in the scene? Like, what would that person do? That's awesome advice. That is awesome advice. And that is exactly like I, someone told me that someone gave me that advice. And I was like, that is re that is such a great way to look at it That's because it. we're all playing a part and you're just like. Because sometimes we're confident, sometimes we're not. Sometimes yeah. we feel good, sometimes we feel... Because guess what? The person, the actor in the movie didn't really do that in real life. Yeah. They just read off a thing and then committed to it. And that's what I do when I have to have, like, big girl calls. Yeah. You know, and it really works. It's, like, such a good little kind of, like, life hack. Um, last thing I was just going to say... Oh, I'm circling back to the making a movie of uh, Mythic, Quest, uh, Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet on a season. Uh, and they do auditions for to play you mm -hmm. and... It is exactly what Hollywood is like. It's like they just want to call on people that they're fans of or they think are hot or they think, you know. Yeah. And then you would ultimately get played by Justin Long, but you're like, oh, Jason Momoa. Yeah, Straight Momoa. Off. Yeah. Get Gosling Momoa, in here. Joe Manganiello. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be that. It would we be actually had Manganiello on John an episode. John Cena. We had Manganiello on an episode. Uh, he's the fucking best. He's so funny. I was in acting class with him at Leslie Kahn, which oh is God, where so we great. used It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, the pilot, to practice auditions with uh, my acting coach, who was a one Richie Keen. What? Yep. See, like, okay, <laughs> this is the thing. Like, I, 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 I very rarely find myself in situations where I'm being... Like the, hearing this from you is like really profound to me, and, I, and I, I'll think about it a lot. I'll think about it tonight. I'll go home and I'll tell Caitlin about it, and I, and it will fuel me uh, to keep doing what I'm doing, um, tr truly, because I know what that I know I have relationships, um, not directly with people, but with shows or performers or writers or people who I looked up to or people who I wanted to be when I was younger, and like I know how. Uh, I know what that relationship can be like. So mm -hmm. to hear that your friends feel that way about me is like super profound. And like, it, that is the kind of shit that like will definitely make me cry at some point, but I'm not Aww. gonna do it right now. Uh, but I, oh, because but it, you haven't hydrated in f the four hours I've be, held well, you captive. Well, because I knocked all my You're gonna start water. drawing the prison. Uh, I'm just, I want you to have to feel how Poppy feels in the office with Ian drawing the prison with the prison bars, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but yeah, uh, but, but, but on top of that, like, I don't get to hear, I just, I don't read message boards. I don't read reviews. I don't read, like, I, I so I don't really hear people talking about my work that often. Mm -hmm. And, like, so it's crazy to hear that you were in an acting class, like, doing. You're doing, yes. It was the, when wrote, Charlie like, so pretended to have cancer. And she <laughs> yeah. came in. And we did it all, I mean, the whole, because uh, we would work a month on something uh, just to, you know, whether it was like a, a drama, a comedy, and that's what we worked on for a month. Well, that was the Army audition Army Hammer scene. was also in the class and as well. Wow. Not a it's scar on my body. <laughs> what happened to your thumb? 
This was oh that this is just for me. I'm you know That's not I sent him I sent him a picture of this just to <laughs> make just to his get day. Him going. My, severed, <laughs> my severed thumb. Not he said, hey, big boy. No, but yeah, no, we were in class together. Not one nibble. I'm a little insulted, frankly. That was the scene that Caitlin auditioned with to get the job. And you know, uh, and then I remember because we were always. I don't think I even had an agent at the time. Maybe like a commercial agent at Abrams or something, you mm -hmm. know. But um, I remember all of my choices, and they were very like reverse, 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 reverse. And then she just did it, and I was like, "That's it." Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, I see, obviously. Uh, but uh, I was like, "Oh, it, perfect, fucking." Per it's very rare that I work on something and I want something. I mean, I was a kid that I wasn't even. I, did, I don't think I was even SAG eligible. But where I'm not like, I feel like I could have done that better. Mm -hmm. And when you see Caitlin, you're like, "Nope, couldn't yeah. have done it better." straight up she's the best even on the mic like shit like she she i love people that make me angry and jealous when i see their performances uh because that's just <laughs> I, when i see caitlin work I, i'm like god like how the fuck? and again totally. it's just it's frustrating but she uh, like it's such it, a again gift. she doesn't hear that or see that and so whenever like people like the young actors on on mythic quest mm -hmm. like when they came to our house for the first time and met her I was like, what's going on? And they were like, we revere her. Like, we grew up watching her. And, yeah. and they're like, you're fine, whatever. We revere her. And and I'm like, tell, go tell her that. Because I'm telling you, she doesn't feel that. She doesn't. She doesn't get offers for things. Like, she's she's just going to work every day and doing her doing her job. I have a theory. People tend to talk shit to our faces and talk nice behind our backs. Mm -hmm. You know? It's yeah. Like, yeah, what's that shirt, asshole? Yeah, yeah. Who's I mean, the I'll best guy? I'll tell you right now, I think people like you two should run everything. Just even hearing the way you talked about the different generations and like the way that you coach people, and Whitney's very similar. Like I think just the impact that I've seen people that don't even work in the industry, the way that they talk, say like, Rob wouldn't say that, or like I should ask uh, this girl comedian about my character that I'm writing, just because of the impact that they see on shows like that. I mean, I think people like you guys should run all the shows. Well, I want to get it right. And, and, and honestly, at the end of the day, there's a selfishness to it. You know, I think for the most part, progress happens when there's a little bit of selfishness at the end. Like with Hollywood, it's like, you're never going to get the people to not be sexist that run. Like, you're just going to have to make something that's not and then prove that it's lucrative and go see. No one wants to see that other shit you were doing. Those days are over. Like, it's no longer a good business model, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, show, like, for me, it's like, if I get this character wrong, I'm just a bad business person. I'm just like a bad writer. I, you know, I want to get it right. But people and that then are, it's also progressive. Great. People that are looking up to people like, you, like, like, like the two of you are people that aren't putting out, like, hacky material or, like, stereotypical characters mm -hmm. because they're seeing that, like, they're also, seeing someone succeed that's not doing one, it. But number one, it's also not funny. That's yeah. the other thing. It's like when people are like, why can't I say tranny? It's like, go for it. Well, because there's... And then they go, you guys won't, don't like jokes. There wasn't a joke. That was a sloppy, like nothing. You can say that word in a clever, incisive way if you can figure out a way to subvert it or like sublimate it into something where it makes the, uh, people think or whatever. Yeah. You know, great, but it's just a, not a good joke first. Like as but Rob there's so saying, many people that are being rewarded first, for that, and then it's a racist joke. But there's so many people that are being rewarded for jokes like that that it's very easy to want to lean into it. Yeah. And, but to see people that are succeeding without doing that, it kind of gives you a room to be like, oh, I don't do that either. I I, I would go one for, step further too, which is like to your point, incentivizing people to to and look what the right thing is. I I, I don't know, but in terms oh, of do. like. <laughs> In, in, in terms of like d uh, d diversifying the experience, right? So that's a word that it's like, it, um, just hearing the word diversity freaks people out because yep. they're like, that's a hot button. Well, issue. to them, they just go, I'm not getting a job. Mm -hmm. I'm excluded. Right. We're it, making it fair and I don't deserve to be here. So I'm going to lose my job. Yeah. It's just that probably if you don't have a job, there, by the way, there's so much fucking work right now and there's so many different avenues and so many different opportunities for people to create shows yeah. that if you're not working, uh, there's a number of different reasons as to why that could be. It might not be your time. You haven't gotten lucky yet. You got to keep at it. Or you're just not that good. Right, right. And there's a reality to that. Thank you. Um, and and maybe historically, like mediocre dudes, like we're able to work and now Slide you're just not by. able to it work. It kind so of just off. became a meritocracy. And yeah. like, that's probably going to be frustrating for a lot of people. But the whole point is that surrender the opportunity. You know, that's the what's going to have to happen. And, uh, but it's interesting to me when everyone's like, oh my God, you, you cast so diverse. Are you, your crew is diverse and all this stuff. And it's like, well, that makes the show better. That's it, the thing. It makes so it So if you better. can incentivize people 
in positions of power. I didn't as, feel so, as, I'm not hiring people off the street I feel bad for. It but makes so the show It's better. selfish on my part. That's right. And they say in all, um, and, and again, bottom line 101, you like use your greed to, to <laughs> make a uh, progressive choice is that offices that are um, integrated, diverse, and have a lot of women make more money than ones that don't. They just make more money. Yeah. Like, so just go, okay, this is like actually just me being a good business person. You know, even if you're racist and sexist and that'll never change about you. Just like, you well, know. I think people are so shocked by seeing diverse staffs because it's so hard to get in the room. It's so hard to get the job. Well, I talked about this, and this is, I was going to talk to you about Clubhouse, uh, which is this app where you can just jump on at any time, and then all your, you know, fans will jump, they follow you, and they can yeah. talk to you at any time. And it's and, just like OnlyFans. And I, no, it's not. <laughs> it is not. And the last thing I will say is that I went on there, and I was, um, there's a lot of uh, people in the African-American community that want to be in, you know, specific businesses, and I asked them, I was like, you know, because I've really struggled with, in television shows, you hire a hair person, and they just can't do black hair and yeah. I'll cast someone and they're like this person can't do my hair and you're like wait what they, they're a hair person like what are you talking about like how can you even get in the union you can also do black hair black makeup whatever and then um I always thought that was just so ridiculous and then I go on clubhouse and there's all these uh african-american hair and makeup people and I'm like why don't I know you why why isn't your resume on my and they're like because you have to get in a union and in order to get in a union you have to have uh 24 episodes of it or 60 days on a production and that's based on the model of 24 episodes a year now we're doing 10 six a year mm -hmm. and they can't get their hours they can't even get into the union so there's a lot of structure mm -hmm. uh that really just keeps people out on the institutional level that need to yes change. and you don't know that again when you're coming into it and it feels like you're uh, speaking on behalf of a straight white man you, you don't know that. So all you're seeing is your own struggle, your own struggle, your mm -hmm. own struggle. And then then I just, ha again, have the luxury of then becoming successful, getting what I want, becoming, and then you start to, and then I'm open to being educated by people who are like, okay, great. I'm not taking your struggle away from you. Mm -hmm. However, I want to point out a couple of things. And then they just point out a couple of facts. That one is a great example where, okay, you have a structure and a system that is set up that excludes people, human beings, just in general. White people too, white, straight white guys right. as well. It's exclusionary because, like a union is a good example, um, which is supposed to uh, be a form of solidarity for mm -hmm. good reason, mm -hmm. but at the same time, when you have that pool and there's only so much work, then it becomes exclusionary to a certain point. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, that exclusion has kept out lots of different human beings, mm -hmm. but most specifically women and other marginalized people. So how do you break through those structures and through those systems? It's going to be messy and difficult, and it's going to take time. And then the question becomes, well, how much time, motherfucker? Because mm -hmm. I've been waiting for a long, that's obviously what you yeah. hear a lot of people say, and rightfully so, which is how much time do you, that's the James Baldwin quote, like how much yeah. time do you fucking need? Like at a certain point, we're gonna come in and burn it down. And that's what we're seeing. And I believe that the culture and the community, again, maybe, this is just maybe too selfish, but I think our shit is better because of it. Because we are, whether we were forced into it or not, we are now in a position where we, we have to listen to other points of view. And then when you have seven or eight different points of view of really funny, really t t talented people together, that's just automatically going to make your shit better. Yeah. So why not? Why aren't you embracing that? I, I don't understand. Because I think there's a fear of like of like losing out. Like if I add someone that's not like the main quality, it's just like with comedy. Like for me, you know, <laughs> um, like when I like for years and years when I did stand up comedy, I would only until we got a female booker at Zane, mm -hmm. I would only or at clubs, I would only get booked on shows that were all women like all women shows. Mm. And I would only get to open for women because there was no way that a man, they're not gonna relate to you, they're not gonna find you funny. So you would only get that for so long. And I think people are really scared to give. Well, but then you're being, so and then, but then whoever was booking that, not, I mean, Lucy, you're the best, but the person booking is going, oh, she you're, it. <laughs> you're actually in a weird way, you're being sexist and phobic, but you're also being sexist towards the men that are coming to see the show. Cause you think all men are phobic. All mm -hmm. men don't think that someone that, you know, so to me, there's a lot of, <laughs> I'm just going to defend the white man, uh, straight white Thank man, real you. quick. Thank you. For I just fucking once. But it is the kind of thing that's like, there's a lot of sexism in going like, oh, 
guys won't find that funny. No, that's you. How, how you see guys? Like you're. I know pl plenty. I mean, all my guy friends think you're the funniest. Yeah, I mean, I mean you had the same thing, correct? Did you not get? And here comes your lady comic, and, and everybody goes to the bathroom, and because it's like you guys there's ready no for way I can. Lady, this exactly. next comedian's beautiful. <laughs> what? But then as soon as as soon as we got the female Booker Lucy, it was just like night and day. Mm -hmm. It was like she's like, no, people can like all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But and, they're also never exposed to it because you never book them. So how are they ever going yeah. to even know? So what they find I'm funny? really appreciative for 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 straight white men like you who have these <laughs> platforms because it makes all the other ones go oh my god we can like so many things yeah we can paint our nails <laughs> but we'll just call it war paint yeah yeah like, it's just, i mean it's just like okay it's drywall that's drywall yeah. don't worry but last thing like with the female directors thing i get that because of course i get this question all the time which is like i'm are there no female directors it's like okay so no one will listen because i know actresses get to drive this conversation the people that aren't there when anyone's hired mm -hmm. I, I you know i'm always like can we have like a, a meeting with the line producers those are the people that actually hire people and and it's illegal to ask someone their ethnicity. It's illegal to ask their age or their gender. But they're supposed to hire completely equally now for this inclusion rider. But they are all white guys because that's how it always has been. And they just want to call their guy. They yeah. just want to call their friend that delivers for them every time. And they, how are they going to find these people? So I wanted to do like a Tinder for uh, crew mm -hmm. that was because there's tons of diverse crew in Atlanta. There's tons on commercials. They're just not you know mm -hmm. able to get in these unions. And then there's this thing where line producers are all of a sudden supposed to know a hundred Asian grips. Like yeah. how, where where? And and again, I'm I, I'm not asking for sympathy because there, there, there's no. It's I'm, ridiculous. I've made you the, sit here for three hours. You deserve sympathy. But, but yeah, truth, if you didn't notice, this, <laughs> this this podcast is like shares for a well tour. It just goes on and on and on. <laughs> Well, I enjoy We're talking like to you, thing. and I enjoy talking about this very thing. And you know what? Howard does this. He always says, last thing, yeah, when he yeah. knows there's another one, and that's not what I'm doing. Yeah. Last thing, here's my thesis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but that that it is, because of California state labor law, it is really difficult. You can't say, okay, I would like to hire a person of color for this particular position, because you can't ask somebody, say, via, like, on a phone call. Mm -hmm. Certainly anybody, like, you, I, I want to hire, very specifically, a gay, a, a gay writer, because of... I, I want that that point of view. Okay, right. But uh, how 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 can I ask someone if they're gay? No. Now, now you have to go. Are you right? No, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I'm not gay, but are you? <laughs> so those provisions were put into place to protect people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to be able to get reasons. just right. Yes. And what's happening now is that you. I had the fucking weirdest conversation with somebody recently, where I said, "Oh, okay, I'm looking for a, a very specific voice, and I'm I'm looking for a, a, a younger gay man." Uh, someone who's grown up in a generation where it's maybe a little bit more acceptable than it was and yada, yada, yada. So they sent me these writers, five writers, and I was like, okay, and I read them, and I said, okay, these are all gay men. And they said, well, we we can't say. You said they look gay. I'm like, well, I said, <laughs> well, are, are, are they gay? And they're like, we think so. And we're like, well, how do you think so? And they're like, they're well, actors. you know. They're writers. They're, they're emotional. Like, literally, literally, you know. And I'm like, do, what, what do I know? They're like, well, we can guess. I'm like, Jesus, fuck, like we are now, prof these are professional adults who are saying, well, we should just guess based on an affectation, based on a stereotype, based on whatever it is, and we can't have an open and honest conversation <laughs> about it. Motherfuckers, we're not gonna be able to change anything if we can't talk about it. They and said, then they're like, dude, They said, well, their great. writing is in a Lisa Frank notebook, so we just assumed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just with the um, with and this is something I, I think about Caitlin uh, when I when I want to talk about this. It's also the idea of people are like, well, there's only six percent uh, female directors. N that's that's the percentage that say yes. Me I pass on everything because it's like I I don't. First of all, until there's childcare on sets women cannot say yes to these directing jobs. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times offers are made to women to direct movies that are kind of like they can't say yes. It doesn't count. And then they will all the, all the women passed. Yeah, because they have babies, they have children. They can't go to New Zealand for eight months, you know? So there's this this thing where um, there's this there's only 6%, yeah, because it's not hospitable. Same thing with uh, female gamers. It's like, there's only this percent female or uh, women in STEM yeah. or, or yeah. whatever. It's like, yeah, because why would anyone want to be here? Yeah. You know, like, first it has to be accommodating and then it will attract them, you know? It's sort of, it's that kind of thing. There's no enough female writers. Yeah, because most writers are, my, I remember my, my first assistant I ever had, she was so brilliant and so funny, I hired her to be on the second season of the NBC show and then she got another job and she went I actually don't want to be a writer this is awful 
you know? So it's like, we can't keep them either yeah. if it's going to be like this, you know? So if there's not childcare, if you still have nine in and out trucks coming at every, you know, uh, episode, but you're not having, you know, someone to, and I even uh, offered the solution. What if there's some kind of director shadowing program where you can, a female can shadow a director and then do childcare starting at three, you know, so that the director's kids mm -hmm. can come and whatever. So it's like, it's also not, people love that statistic, but they don't want to look like, look at, okay, what if, what if, um, 30% of all the directors were female and they were offered big movies this year but had to pass. Like, mm -hmm. that's the statistic I'm way more interested in. Well, okay, so this is a... You could do a whole podcast on this because yeah. the, the, the truth of the matter is, like, this is part of the work and part of the issue and part of the problem. And you, because you and I are on the other end of things and we see that it... And everybody recognizes that it's a systemic and structural problem, right? And so s systems and structures can be torn down and burned down, great but something needs to be built in its stead right. to then foster and facilitate a change. Mm -hmm. And that is hard. <laughs> yeah, we love to burn it down. Yeah. We hate never, to build it. Never really note without a fix. You exactly. know, that's my number one rule. <laughs> that's, yes, and that is a really difficult thing to do. And so who's in charge of that? Well, I'm a boss and I'm in charge of my television series and I have to deliver a television series. So now I also want to be ethically and socially responsible. So I, I also have this other thing I got to do, great. But then I also have to, help work with Whitney and other people to build now a whole new structure and new system. Yeah. And I think a lot of us, what you find is that we're all game for it. Like mm -hmm. everybody's into it, but then it's just a, it is truly a shitload of work mm -hmm. to deconstruct and then reconstruct a system. Right, and so, right. yes, again, this is easy for me to say because I, I've had an easier road, but it is going to be hard and it's going to take time and we're going to have to navigate things and rebuild something. And surrender some opportunities. Sure. Sure. You know? Shit, but, but this is a system that was set up over a century and a half. Well, the entertainment industry, I should right. say, is was a system that was set up by a very specific group of people, men, uh, a, a, a long time ago and then fostered for 150 years, mm -hmm. 130 years. So, so now, great, we're burning it down. What's the new system that we're, we're putting together? Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be a, very, a very intense and long collaboration to, to do it. And then I think it's important that, you know, and um, I think I was talking about this with Donnell Rawlings or something, not only give the person the opportunity, but when they get there, don't walk on eggshells around them or, or treat them differently so that they can't understand, like, so they can be good at their job and learn the job. That's or, the other thing. I see a lot of people hiring, you know, African-American uh, women, and then they're just like, is that okay? Do you, is that okay? Is that good? Like what? And now she has to be the well, hall she's monitor. The, she's the arbiter. Now she's the That's HR right. department. Yes. yes. And also, don't treat them like your trophy, where you're like, "Well, look what I did." Oh my well, god. Well, look at my trans writer. There is a. Well, one, look what I look at my gay character. Like then it's one, like okay. Well. There is a one showrunner who posted a photo of, uh, like a like a writer's room, and there's a Native American writer, and when they went to go pose, the showrunner was like, "No, you come next to." I'm not gonna say names. You come next to me, and she was like. It was very clear, like she just wanted to pose next to me in the photo, yeah. and she never like takes any of my jokes or hasn't given me a script to write yet. Yeah, it was just like that idea of let's take a picture together. So it's like the performative activism stuff. I heard you talk about this on something. I'm so relieved that we're so aligned on this because there's no one I can talk to about this, which is the kind of thing of like you know posting on social media. You're the one benefiting from that. Yeah. When you benefit about it. To retweet someone else who needs the followers, who does know what they're talking about. Just like give an opportunity to someone else, like give your platform to someone else for the day or whatever. Like, because a lot of this self serving justice warrior shit, it's only, but you're just getting more likes and your metrics are getting up and people think you're a good person. And so you just used them again. You just exploited the very yeah, people Hollywood that you're pretending. Yeah, really big on that. That's why, like, you ever noticed, like, the moment that, like, the moment that, like, a male actor mentions that he supports his gay fans or like on the cover of every gay magazine they uh, win yeah. awards yeah. they're like you're like yeah. what you know by the way you don't get points for that so that's the other thing with you i noticed every one of your interviews uh at the end of the beginning they're like this guy is such a nice he's the nicest guy this guy he is such i'm like yes of course but we shouldn't be giving out points for that. Do you know yeah, what I'm saying? How weird a, is it that yeah. we're in a field where we give points for something that should just be expected as I, but i will say that i noticed that that have you noticed this, like, oh, you met, oh, I met, um, oh, you know who I met? Uh, um, Forrest Whitaker. Yeah, I met Forrest Whitaker. Oh, is, is he a nice guy? That's always the first thing that I hear hmm. people say, like, oh, yeah, um, you know, I met um, Michael Jordan. Nice guy. Such mm -hmm. a nice guy, because I think people are surprised hmm. when they hear about it. Yes. I, I think you want to, 
you want people to be kind uh -huh. and you want to know that like the people you look up to are yeah. kind, right? And you're like, oh, was he or she, was she cool? But it's definitely more dudes than anything Because there's been so much duplicity and this guy was my hero and then I found out that he was like watching yeah. this guy. You know, it's like, I think people have been duped so much uh, recently that I, I see that. But there used to be a time where everyone just assumed all actors were assholes, like, and that's assumed right. all producers were assholes. Like yeah. it was, it was, that's how it was, you know? And it's, it's really fascinating to me that, um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how people in this business, which is the stock market, it, I mean, it's like a business like any other one, it's a corporate run business, will change when people are sort of trying to do the right thing. It'll be interesting to see now, because it's, you know, evolution-wise, it used to be sort of survival of the strongest, you know, um, dog eat dog, who could eat the most dogs. Now it's gonna be survival of the nicest, Yeah. in a way. Well, I, Meg and I are always talking about this, which is like, you know, if, if the system was set up paternalistically, which it obviously was. Okay, great. So now, so now let's just say theoretically the system could be set up maternalistically mm -hmm. or just from a different, from a different point of view. How much does it deviate from the system that we currently live in? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure in some ways dramatically yeah. and in other ways not as much. And so what's great about being alive right now is that we're sort of like at the forefront of that and it's going to be determined by us and then i mean by well, i don't mean by me i mean by mm -hmm. us as a generation but, and I then mean, most importantly you. the next yeah and i'm going to play a role actually in yes sexually abusive behavior in a workplace or any any environment is no longer tolerated and mm -hmm. therefore scorched earth great well, okay very clear well I've been on a couple sets recently but you know what else shouldn't sure. be tolerated i was on a, some really um like open set like a closed nudity set was open and people were taking pictures inviting friends and that kind of thing i've been in that situation recently yeah but there's also, That's I'll tell you the story, crazy. but also when I come onto your set and have a nude scene or agree to play a character that's sexy or something, please don't treat me like I'm about to sue you at any moment. And like, I just show up to sets to get like, when they're like, is that okay? Do you want to say? Yeah. I said yes to the job. The joke mm -hmm. was in the script. Like, I would love to do this. And I'm like, okay, but if you want to change it, like I don't. And then like, the, you know, the sound guy going in, I'm like, no, dude, you got to do your job. I'm not suing you. Like just this thing of you know, when you're in your nude scenes or whatever, and I was like, are you okay, is everything fine? I'm like, okay, I just, I know you guys are trying to like protect women because you respect women, but can you give me the benefit of the doubt that if I need something, I'll let you know? Yeah. And then please listen to me. Moving forward, you don't have to check on me every five seconds. Like I, like I got this, you know? Well, we, so we started using an intimacy coordinator mm -hmm. on, on Mythic Quest and it's like, why they weren't doing this from the beginning. Yeah. Like I, they, they, there's a lot of jokes about them and shit, like I've heard, but I, it's truly the greatest it's the it's the greatest because mm -hmm. you have a third party whose job it is there to make everybody feel comfortable and it's somebody that you can pull aside who actively is there. I like pasties, I just need a new pair of money. like yes. you know. And so that it doesn't put you now you're a very assertive person. You're a boss, right? So you walk into a set and you feel very comfortable yeah. saying to everybody, fuck off, I'm doing this, I'm doing but that. that guest star that comes yes, in. Yes, I know a lot of actors who are, don't feel as comfortable and then they don't, they want to go along for the ride and they're like, oh, things are moving fast and the director asked me to do this and the director's not a bad person, but he or she's just trying to make their day and mm -hmm. all of a sudden I don't feel comfortable doing this and then they feel exploited and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a third party who's in there that's like, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that's taking on the responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'm going to. You're uh, not crazy. You're not overreacting. That's right. I'm, I'm just doing I'm, my job. And I'm also for the for the for the um, for the sound guy and the producers. I'm also um, going to mitigate against any litigation. I'm the bad right? guy. I'm the bad guy. And if there's a problem, it's it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And and if I see there's another human being on here who's the problem, I'm going to make it their fault because it's their fault, and I'm going to take this to HR. And what's great is that it allows for. What I found is that allows for the set to become that much more comfortable. I get obsessed though with new jobs that never existed five years ago. What's that person's background? Resume about how did it's a new job? You didn't go to school for it. It's just what is it? Is it advertising? Is it is it legal? I asked the girl that was with me on a, a shoot I did recently, and I think she was in. She was just in production. She was like a PA for a real long time. So she just kind of knew all the crazy shit that goes down. Yeah. You know, she was like, if if people are gonna sleep in the same bed, you put one under the both covers and then one under between the sheet and the covers. Like yeah. she just had had to do it a lot as a PA. I, I, what I found crazy is how often I would talk to a, a specifically actresses, but also actors where, you know, where I would say, this is even before we did the intimacy stuff, mm -hmm. uh, I had the intimacy coordinator. I would say, hey, um, like let's have a conversation about this like weeks before so we can talk about this. It might be awkward. Yeah. I just want to like be open to where you are. And then they'd be like, oh God, thank God. I. 
I, the last job, we just showed up mm -hmm. and everybody was so nervous. Even the director was like, oh, I don't know what to, it's all awkward and no one's a professional. All of a sudden everybody's really like, they, they, they turned 12 years old again. When there's like, a sex scene, yeah. Who the fuck is, is in charge? It's wild. And yes, why isn't somebody stepping up and saying like, this is a professional set mm -hmm. and we're, we're all professionals. Like, let's talk about this in advance. Yeah. Let's prep this the way we would prep a stunt. And we're all too scared to talk about it. It's that, it's that yes. like deep religious sort of um, yes. programming of like. Oh, but we're okay. talking about a stunt. Yeah. We're talking about how we're gonna how we're gonna blow the car up. I, are we in a simulation? I, I'm not smart enough to answer. That question. <laughs> I just feel like you have had to talk about that on in your writers' room. We have discussed it. Yeah. And, uh, unfortunately, it's a bunch of actors and and comedy writers, so yeah. we haven't gotten to the bottom of it. Yeah. But, but I think I that's kind of, I think I well, it's amazing to me because we're all like, are we in a simulation? It's like, when you're a writer, you get to make a simulation, yes. you know, which is kind of cool. Yeah. The idea that someone's writing our lines, it's like, okay, no, I would like to have credit for that thing I just said, not the video game guy. I'm, I'm open to the weird and, 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 and wondrously strange uh, experience of being alive. I have no fucking idea what that means or where it comes from, but I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be as open as I can as and, I navigate it. And can I just say like, you know, this is, you're such a good writer because of this too. The most emotionally um, examined people, the people that look at themselves, that are self-aware, that want to um, heal old invisible wounds and stuff, also happen to be the best writers, I believe. Like when I'm watching, what you did with um, uh, Hornsby and the projecting his mother onto every, I mean that, clearly there was a very deep understanding of psychology and you work very hard at that and I think that that's what makes great comedians also, but I think when people are like, I just, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to be a writer, like start learning that stuff because mm -hmm. you're writing characters and human beings and you need to be able to empathize with them and then defend them when they do something indefensible and understand why they're doing what they're doing. But have you seen any of the second season of Mythic West? I've seen a lot of it. Well, yeah, the, um, I have, but uh, I miss. I had to skip through two. There's two I haven't seen. Okay, so that, I just watched the standalone. We deal with a lot. We deal with this very thing quite a bit. Which Fascinating. Is like trying to empathize, not to excuse behavior, but to empathize with characters you wouldn't normally empathize with, to at least get a gain a better understanding of why people are the way they are. Because there's also anytime someone comes to me with anger, I'm like, you're sad, you're sad, and this is your your rage is your yeah. how you're self soothing. Like I I am at such a hardcore. You know, it drives you nuts. Why are you doing this? Yeah, I know. I'm just saying, it drives you nuts when you come or like we talk about something that person. And I'm like, well, because my therapist trained me. I have this I love you tattoo right here in white, which is um, uh, I was talking to her about someone that had been really shitty to me on a job, and I was like, and then they said this, and then they said this, and then they wouldn't let me do this, and they wouldn't let me do another take, and it was so clear that they were trying to not let me, anyway, whatever. And um, she goes, wow. Sounds like they're in a lot of pain. And I was like, it like blew my whole world open. Yeah. And now I just see when people lose their temper as like a, like a 12 year old that just like is scared. Yeah. And it changes your life. Oh yeah, it's just hard to have empathy when you're at a 10. And so if you're like, and we're all at a 10 when we feel like we're being attacked. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's only in retrospect where you can look back and be like, oh right. We're gonna, Stop talking. <laughs> Thank you. I well, are you love gonna find, you. Are you gonna cut? You're not gonna make it this long in the actual show, are you? Oh, we never do. We'll okay, cut out good. me talking. Okay, good. All of my uh, lines and replace them with. Um, uh, I re I re record everything later, what and I put like jokes Vicky, in. Vicky, small wonder. Full robot. Vicky, small wonder. Yeah. I do have a video of me crying with my face not moving at all. And I was like, because I just want to see if I could do it. Remember, you know when I lie down to cry? Because if yeah. you have a lot of makeup on and you need to cry, you have to lie down so that it doesn't fuck everything up. One of, but one of the greatest, now I'm still talking, but, uh, one of the greatest um, rumors of all time with regards to television and pop culture is that, um, that Jamie, the actor that played uh, Jamie, was actually the lead singer of Smashing Pumpkins because he looks exactly, exactly like him. You never heard that? Uh-uh. I did recently hear that Mae West uh, might have been black or a man. Oh, you ever heard that? part? Oh, really? Mm hmm You've never heard I've that? I've heard the man thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's Last thing, okay, in the Ancestry test episode, yes. I had, when David Sinclair was on, he's Australian, and apparently Australian ancestry, Poppy, because of the fact that it was like criminals mostly that yeah. inhabit it, they have this like really violent, like shame about their violent past. Mm -hmm. There's something really interesting about that to me. Okay. Lead into it. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on the board. Because <laughs> that's all, all I, when I was watching that show, I was like, I'm so clear on the, psychi the, psycho the psychology of the characters. Like, I got to know their ancestry. Will you come in and help break it with us? Yes. Okay. Yes. Done. I will. Yes. I love you. Don't write elephants. I end these like incredibly weird. 
Would you like to promote? I want to promote. Yeah, I was like, like no, did you I have the last word? Can you tell us where to no, follow you? No, that's such a great way to end it. I, I just end these really weird. Just but people are gonna be like, where can we watch the show? Where can we follow? Oh, I don't care about that. If you don't know how to watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia or Mythic Quest at this point, there's nothing I can do to help you. There's yeah. just nothing. You could pay their cable bill. I don't know what to tell you. You guys, you figure out a way to watch Big Bang Theory on a plane. <laughs>